نبدا يا دكتور طب جاهزين جاهزين الصوت واضح على بركه الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صاحب المعالي نائب وزير الثقافه نائب رئيس مجلس اداره هيئه التراث اصحاب السعاده السيدات والساده السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته يسر هيئه التراث ان ترحب بكم جميعا في ملتقى الاكتشافات الاثريه الافتراضي والذي يعقد خلال يومي الثلاثاء والأربعاء نستعرض فيه أبرز الأعمال الأثرية المنفذة في المملكة العربية السعودية ونتائجها العلمية التي تسهم في صقل صورة الثقافة حضاريا وتبرز دور المملكة الاستراتيجي كونها تحتوي على حضارات متعاقبة مرت على أراضيها وفي بداية الملتقى نتشرف بدعوة نائب وزير الثقافة نائب رئيس مجلس إدارة هيئة التراث معالي الأستاذ حامد بن محمد فائز لإلقاء كلمة راعي الملتقى صاحب السمو الأمير بدر بن عبد الله بن فرحان آل سعود وزير الثقافة رئيس مجلس إدارة هيئة التراث فليتفضل مشكورا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السيدات والسادة السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته ومرحبا بكم في هذا الملتقى العلمي الذي نأمل من خلاله إلقاء الضوء على ما تحتويه بلادنا من آثار ومكتشفات مهمة تؤكد عمق الروابط التي تصل الجزيرة العربية بالحضارة الإنسانية الكبرى منذ فجر التاريخ وإلى اليوم واسمحوا لي في البدء أن أقضي بالنيابة كلمة صاحب السمو الأمير بدر بن عبد الله بن فرحان آل سعود وزير الثقافة منذ فجر التاريخ وإلى اليوم كانت أرض المملكة العربية السعودية مستقرا للحضارات المتعاقبة عبر مختلف العصور ومحطة رئيسة ومهمة في شبكة الطرق التجارة التاريخية وجزءا مهما ومؤثرا في الحضارة الإنسانية وسط تفاعل إيجابي ممتد ومستمر في الحضارة البشرية وقد دلت الأبحاث العلمية في مجال المسح والتقييب الأثري والدراسات الأثرية المتخصصة على الدور الحضاري الكبير للجزيرة العربية ومدى التأثير والتأثر لإنسانها كونه أحد الفاعلين في مسيرة التاريخ البشري وبفضل دعم قيادة الرشيدة حققت بلادنا إنجازات كبيرة في هذا المضمار وتعيش المملكة اليوم نهضة غير مسبوقة على جميع أصعدة تراثنا الحضاري تمثلت في تحقيق العديد من الكشوفات الأثرية في كل منطقة من مناطقها يقودها نخبة من العلماء والمختصين السعوديين ويشارك معهم العلماء مميزون من أفضل الجامعات والمؤسسات العالمية المتخصصة حضور الكريم لا شك أننا نشعر بسعادة ونحن نشمد هذه النهضة في قطاع الآثار والتراث الحضاري في المملكة العربية السعودية ما يدفعنا لبذل المزيد من الجهود مع شركائنا لابراز الحضاريه لتراث المملكه والكشف عن كنوزنا الثقافيه وهذا الملتقى احد اوجه هذه الجهود المباركه بما يوفره من فرص التقاء وتواصل بين المختصين والمهتمين للاطلاع على الحاله الراهنه للمكتشفات الاثريه الوطنيه وختاما نتطلع للمزيد من التطوير ليكون تراث المملكه وسيله للتربيه والتوعيه ومصدرا للعلم والمعرفه ومصدر اعتزاز لابناء الوطن وشاهدا لمكانه بلادنا الحضاريه متمنيا لكم التوفيق والسداد والسلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته. عند قلبك. وعليكم السلام، شكرا معالي النائب. شكرا معالي. والان والان ندعو الرئيس التنفيذي لهيئه التراث سعاده الدكتور جاسر الحربش لالقاء كلمته بهذه المناسبه. دكتور عبد الله. Uh, hello everyone, good morning, good evening, according to your time. I'm really glad to be with you today. Uh, and this is just a very, very brief introduction and saying welcome to everyone uh, attending and watching. And hopefully uh, our next uh, uh, conference will be face to face to have you all in Saudi Arabia and to share with you our amazing experience 
with uh, local and international uh, missions and centers doing this important work in arcology. And uh, just briefly, my introduction, I want to share with you uh, 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 the, the mandate of Heritage Commission, because this is really a very important turning point in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the Saudi arcology uh, missions, where government of Saudi Arabia created almost two years ago, uh, 11 uh, culture, culture commissions. Among them is the Heritage Commission, and it has the mandate that is usually a mandate of, of, of a cultural uh, mission, which is uh, supervising and directing and doing and owning the work in archaeology as a first sector and built heritage as a second sector and uh, handcraft as a, th as a third sector and finally intangible cultural heritage as a fourth sector. And they are, as we all know, are, uh, are, are related uh, related mandates according to UNESCO uh, guidelines. And I'm really happy to have this focused uh, scientific uh, gathering that we are having today and tomorrow. And uh, we are lucky to have this conference in the middle, actually, of a field work. I, I, I was honored to meet, for example, uh, the mission from CN, uh, CNRS a few weeks ago, and the mission of, of uh, University of, of Napoli, Italy, uh, last week in El Jov, and other missions, of course, in all the areas that we are working. And what, what the aim of this, this conference, uh, an online conference, is to share with you what these missions have achieved. And just to give you a brief that we are, we will be listening in the, in the coming two days to, to scientists and researchers and scholars from seven uh, local and international centers that, that who worked with us, uh, I, I mean seven local, sorry, and, and 14 international, uh, giving 24 uh, scientific papers uh, covering all the findings from prehistory until, until recent history. And this is really a chance to share this knowledge with each other and also to help us in the Heritage Commission to plan ahead. We have a very ambitious uh, plan to move the current work uh, in the field in terms of survey, excavation, and other work in archaeology from the current amazing status to a better new level where, where we will increase the number of missions at one site and also we will increase the quality and the methodologies. We, we want to see more technology involved engagement in the work. We want to see more social science engagement we want to see more student and community engagement on the field work, and we want to also to engage the current sites to the master master uh, plan of the Saudi tourism and culture plan, where we want some of the areas, according, I mean, of course, to the guidelines, will be open to people uh, to 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 witness and to see live work from international missions, and we already started this in some areas. So this is briefly what I want to say today. Uh, and I am happy to have نستضيفكم فيه كلكم يعني مستمعين ومحاضرين ومشاركين نطلعكم إن شاء الله على تجاربنا وتجاربكم الناجحة وإن شاء الله أننا نستمتع حنا بالساعات القادمة اليوم وغدا في هالعرض المميز هذا ما نستغني عن أي اقتراحات يعني تصلنا موجودة عندكم كل إيميلاتنا وكل وسائل التواصل حياكم الله مرة أخرى وأنا أشكر الزمر كلهم اللي ساهموا في إعداد هالملتقى وفكم الله جميعا وأنا معكم إن شاء الله طول اليوم بإذن الله في أمان الله شكرا سعادة الدكتور جاسر كما يسرنا أن نستعرض الآن لكم فيلما قصيرا عن ملتقى الاكتشافات الأثرية
شكرا لكم جميعا الآن ندعو الباحثين في الجلسة الأولى لتجهيز أوراقهم للتقدم للجلسة والتي ستكون بعنوان أثار ما قبل التاريخ يديرها الدكتور عبد الله بن محمد الشارخ أستاذ الآثار في جامعة الملك سعود في كلية السياحة والآثار والدكتور عبد الله الشارخ عضو في عدد من البعثات الأثرية الميدانية التي تعمل في المملكة ورئيس الفريق السعودي لمشروع الجزيرة العربية الخضراء ورئيس الفريق السعودي لمشروع موقع نحت الجمل بالإضافة إلى المشروع السعودي في موقع فرسان ومنطقة جازان الدكتور عبد الله له العديد من الأبحاث والدراسات الأثرية في مجال عصور ما قبل التاريخ تفضل دكتور عبد الله وأنتمنى لك التوفيق مع المحاضرين شكرا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم uh, I welcome all in uh, the first session of the uh, symposium of archaeological discoveries in Saudi Arabia uh, we have a number of papers on prehistoric archaeology Uh, without further ado, I introduce our first speaker, Professor Michael Petraglia, who will give a talk entitled The Green Arabia Project. Uh, before that, I'll just give a synopsis of his uh, expertise. Professor Petraglia is a professor of human evolution and prehistory, uh, works at the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History at Jena in Germany. He has a PhD in anthropology. Uh, from the University of New Mexico, Albuquerque, in the United States of America, and he, he is the head of the international team for the Green Arabia project. Uh, please, Mike, you, you may start your uh, presentation. You got 15 minutes. Okay, uh, thank you for that. I'm just... Um trying to share my screen. <laughs> Fortunately, the uh, share option is off. It doesn't allow to share? No. Okay, we got it now. They've given it for me, I guess. Okay. Okay, that's great. Uh, I will uh, let you know each time I would like to uh, change the slide, obviously. I'll alert you to that. Um, but anyway, I'm sorry for that technical problem. And I'm extremely honored to, to be here and start kicking off uh, this session on uh, the archaeological discoveries of Saudi Arabia. I'm going to be giving you a very quick uh, and brief overview of the Green Arabia project that we've been executing for the last 11 years. So in 15 minutes, I will try to share with you 11 years of research. Next, please. Can I have the next slide? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, yes, sure. Michael. Okay. We are working in the slides. And I just want to uh, kick off this talk with uh, simply indicating my my how grateful I am to the the government of Saudi Arabia and its representatives over the last eleven or twelve years. We've had tremendous support uh, from the Saudis uh, uh, of, of various uh, levels, and 
I just want to obviously for today's session, uh, point out my thanks to Dr. Jasser, uh, the, the CEO of the Heritage Commission, uh, because obviously without this kind of support, uh, we wouldn't be able to do the, the, the wonderful uh, and joint work that we've been uh, doing. Next. Okay, so um, I just want to point out that the, the Green Arabia project started about 11 years ago in 2010. And this is a very large scale multidisciplinary effort. We've had a couple hundred participants uh, in the project in terms of uh, students and scholars and visitors uh, and from different countries, from many countries around the world. So this isn't just a sort of a UK or Germany project. There are many people, uh, many scientists coming uh, onto this project in order to tell a story about the, the heritage of, of Saudi Arabia. Advance it, please. Uh, no, that's backwards. Yes. Um, so I should say that uh, we've been really uh, happy because our project has about 95 publications over the last 11 years. So we've been very successful a as a group. Uh, but we've also been working all across Saudi Arabia from north to south, east to west. So we've had multiple project areas, as you'll see. Uh, we also uh, are covering a lot of time. Um, we have uh, archaeological sites over the last million years represented. And we're putting these sites of all time periods into environmental context. So uh, environmental science is a very big part of our work, and we believe that we really cannot understand the development of societies in Saudi Arabia unless we understand the environmental context. So that is very important, fundamental work that we're undertaking. And I'm just happy to report that over the last 11 years, we've had a lot of firsts, as you can see here uh, on the right-hand part of the slide. These are just some of them. But we've had the we reported the first middle paleolithic stratified and dated site. We've had the first hominin fossil, the first human fossil of Arabia on one of our projects. We have the first footprint site. And I think there are many footprint sites in Arabia, and we're going to obviously go out there and look for them. We've also begun uh, not only work on the paleo lakes, the lake, the ancient lakes of Arabia, but we've begun to work in the caves as well. So we reported some of the first archaeology uh, very recently in a cave site um, uh, in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. We've also uh, done extensive work on the rock art of Saudi Arabia. It started at least 10 or 12 years ago, and we've been going full throttle ever since. Uh, we've also done a recent uh, uh, publication on a, the first stratified rock shelter sequence in Arabia with the oldest gold object that at least we know about in Saudi Arabia dating to 3500 BC. So you can see here, we're working on all time periods and the discoveries have been absolutely remarkable. So Saudi Arabia, uh, I think in general, uh, has a huge story to tell us about. And this region is extremely important for understanding the connections between other societies around the world as well, from Africa and all across Arabia, uh, all across Asia. Next, please. And fundamental to our project, uh, the Green Arabia project, is this idea of climatic change. Obviously, climatic change is something that concerns us today in terms of future changes in climate, but also, of course, Saudi society has adapted to very particular environmental circumstances uh, today and in the recent past. But that has always been the case through time. So we're working on sites that exceed a million years. And I can tell you this alternate wetting and drying of the landscapes is absolutely fundamental in order to understand human evolution but also societal change. And so uh, we are working very much again on the environmental context of all archeological sites 
no matter what time period they represent. And you can see here that understanding the climate is crucial to understanding things like, for example, human migrations and connections between societies from Africa to Asia. So, so this is a very important concept, the Green Arabia concept, uh, and it underlies all of our work. Next. And just to give you some highlights of some of the remarkable sites that we have found over the last 11 years, here's one of the oldest archeological sites of Arabia. This is a site we call Tisalgada, and this site dates anywhere between 500 to 350,000 years ago. We've got at least 20 different types of animals on this site, including extinct elephants, Paleoloxodon, uh, and this is a remarkable site. It used to be thought this was just a paleontological site, and that is not the case. We have now discovered archaeological uh, remains on this site in the way of cut mark bones and stone tools on this site. So this gives us a very important picture about what the environments were like, what early humans were doing 500,000 years ago in the Nafud Desert. Next. Um, so we've also documented and dated the oldest, what we call Acheulean sites in Arabia. These are these hand axe cultures uh, uh, that, that are all over Saudi Arabia. And we've been very lucky to date and to put uh, some of these Acheulean sites uh, into context uh, and in their environmental context. And you can see here that these Acheulean sites, these hand axe sites, uh, date anywhere between 400,000 years ago to 225,000 years ago. Now, the importance of this in terms of human evolution uh, can, must be emphasized because here we are dealing with early species of humans, closely related ancestors that are not Homo sapiens. So we're likely dealing with ancestors like Homo erectus or Homo heidelbergensis, but we do not have their fossils yet. Their fossils are in places like the Levant uh, and in, in Africa, but we have uh, no fossils in Arabia yet. But we have plentiful, dozens and dozens of sites that probably date to this very important window of time in the past. Next. Next, please. And, uh, you know, we're not only been looking and searching for early humans across Arabia from a million years ago and more, but also looking for the hallmarks of what we think might be indicating our own species, Homo sapiens. And as uh, I and my colleagues <clears throat> have long been arguing, uh, this is likely in the window of what we call the Middle Paleolithic, Middle Paleolithic technologies, like these Lavawa or Core Flake industries that are plentiful across Arabia. And so I think uh, this is the hallmark of the migration of our own species across Arabia. And we've also been lucky at dating these Middle Paleolithic sites over the last 10 years. And these Middle Paleolithic sites date anywhere between 200,000 and 55,000 years ago. Next. And I'm going to give you some examples of sites which we think are the signpost of our species in Saudi Arabia. This is one that we've just recently published. This is a footprint site. It doesn't have actual stone tools on it, but most remarkably, it has the footprints of ancient humans walking along these lakes. And these footprints have been studied in great detail. Uh, and uh, to make a very long story short, we argue that these footprints represent Homo sapiens based on their morphology. They are not another archaic species of humans like the Neanderthals. And so we've done very detailed uh, biological and morphological work on these footprints. And this is a remarkable site because it seems that 
uh, early humans, our own species, are walking along this ancient lake 125,000 years ago. And I just want to add, this is the first human footprint site of Arabia, but I actually think there are dozens of these types of sites. I think we've all been missing them. So this is very exciting because in January, hopefully, inshallah, we will be conducting some work along uh, other lakes to look for more hominin footprints. Next. And this is an extremely important site to us, Augusta, which we've dated to about 85,000 years ago. Here's the first fossil of any hominin for all of Arabia. And this is a, a finger bone of a fossil which we have precisely dated to 85,000 years ago, directly dated as well on the fossil itself and the lake bed in which it occurs. Uh, and again, to make a very long story short, we have put this fossil finger bone uh, into the category of Homo sapiens. It is different from other archaic species of hominins like the Neanderthals. And this is a very important uh, finding because also this finger bone is associated with Middle Paleolithic technologies. And remember I said these Middle Paleolithic sites are very plentiful all across Saudi Arabia. Again, I think this is a signpost of the dispersal of our own species on into every corner of Saudi Arabia. And just to give you another example, it's remarkable because these lakes, hundreds of which we have been looking at and surveying and studying, have the fossils of even creatures like hippos. So can you imagine how green and how lush these environments were for these early humans dispersing across Arabia? Next. And I just want to give very, very briefly uh, just a point about this recent article that just appeared two, two months ago. Here we have an article in Nature where we have a stacked record of many lakes in the Nafud Desert all in one spot. And this is at Cal Am Amashon in the Nafud and the, as well as the Juba Oasis. Next. And the next, the importance of this is each lake bed, which we've dated between 400,000 years ago and 55,000 years ago, has a different technology. It has the Acheulean sites and it has the Middle Paleolithic sites. So this is a, a fantastic uh, new study and we're very proud of. Uh, and, and, and I think this is extremely important for understanding change through time in Saudi uh, prehistory. Next. And again, the importance of this is not only the changes in technologies and the adaptations of these early humans, but again, this is the signpost likely for different sets of humans all across uh, Arabia. Next. And I just very briefly, because I know I'm already running out of time, I just want to also say that we're also looking at the last 10,000 years. We're using the same kind of methods to look at more recent time periods. And I know a lot of the talks uh, in this uh, seminar series will be about the last 10,000 years. And we are very much studying climate change through time and right up to the present. And we want to understand how societies have been adapting to climatic changes through time in the last 10,000 years. Next. And in, in just about a year ago, we published this article in PNAS, which synthesized all available information that we could get our hands on in terms of the archaeological record of Arabia over the last 10,000 years. And we're looking at climatic change through time. And we see that droughts over the last 10,000 years have played a very critical role in shaping societies in the past. And you can just see here a couple examples I've pulled out that we see that climate change and droughts may have even affected the health and well being of people and animals. That said, next, we also see that people 
have come up with ingenious solutions for dealing with climatic change through time. So this is a story of resilience and adaptation to climatic changes over the last 10,000 years. And I'm really excited to hear the talks over the next two days because I think we're gonna see a lot of talks which are important for looking at the societal development in the context of right. environmental change. Can you conclude, please? Can you conclude? One more, one more slide. So we're right at the end. And I just want to indicate again uh, that will be out in, in Juba, uh, hopefully uh, in, in January. And we're also, like many other groups, studying this uh, these stone structures across Arabia. And we've published our first article on this, but hopefully we will be uh, publishing a lot more in order to understand these stone structures of Arabia and what role they played in societal development. Next, and I just want to thank you and thank all the Saudi organizations which have helped the Green Arabia project through time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. And it was a very splendid talk that you synopsized the whole uh, project in such a short time. We appreciate that. Uh, all the questions will be at the end of the of this session. Now I'd like to uh, introduce our next speaker, Dr. Guillaume Charlo, uh, who will be presenting a paper. Uh, uh, his presentation is the Camel site in the Aljouf region. Uh, the results of the joint Saudi-French mission. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Charlo, he has a PhD in, in Near Eastern Archaeology from uh, Paris, Sorbonne 1, and uh, he's currently a researcher at the French National Center for Scientific Research. He's the head of two archaeological missions in al Bida and the Camel site in the Jof regions. Uh, Guillaume, the floor is yours. Please uh, proceed. Okay, thank you very much, Abdullah. And can you see my uh, PowerPoint? Yes, yes, we can. Perfect. So, hello, everyone. Uh, Salam alaikum wa alaikum Allah. Um, before starting our talk, um, the authors wish to thank uh, very deeply Prince Badr Al Saud, Ministry of Culture, for giving us permission to carry out uh, our research at the Kamel site. And we are also very much indebted to uh, Jasir, Dr. Jasir Yerbish, and Abdullah Azarani uh, at the Heritage Commission for their very efficient help. Some of you have already heard about the Camel sites, and as you may know, these recently discovered representations of camels and equids are absolutely unique and unparalleled on the Arabian Peninsula in the Middle East. Um, these low and high reliefs are um, representations of life-size animals of exceptional archaeological and historical value, but in great danger of destruction. And this rock testimony provides consequently a rich record of the region's prehistoric past and the impressive demonstration of the talent of the ancient artists more than 7,000 years ago. Next one. Okay. Um, the purpose of this short lecture will be to describe the Kamel site with few pictures and to present our field uh, results, in particular concerning its dating. We will also shortly uh, put the Kamel site in a broader uh, art, artistic context in Northwestern Arabia in order to assess the function of the site through the comparisons with other traditions of large site camels identified. The Kamel site is located in the Jov province, it's North Arabia, northeast of Dumat el Jindal, on the road between Sakaka and Suwer in a very arid environment. Three short visits in March 2016 and 2017 provided a first inventory of this monumental rock art site, but without in depth study. The publication of the discovery of the site was broadcasted widely early 2018. Since 2018, the site is under the study of a large international Saudi-French team as part of an agreement between the Heritage Commission of the Ministry of Culture and the French National Center for Scientific Research. Research and fieldwork at the site was supported by many 
international institutions, the Max Planck Institute for the uh, Science of Human History, the Freie Universität in Berlin, and King of course, King Saud University in Riyadh, as well as many others. In October 2018, our multidisciplinary research project began to carry out a systematic study of the site. The main aim of the fieldwork was to carry out an archaeological survey of the site and its surroundings, detailed survey and documentation of all curved study, uh, surfaces um, at the site, to establish a protocol for the protection and restoration uh, of the reliefs that are uh, suffering really uh, deeply from erosion, and finally to establish, to establish a chronology for the site through uh, test excavations and other techniques. The site was therefore assessed by a large team of specialists that you have the names here, and main results on the dating of the site to the prehistoric period were recently published last September. The rock reliefs are concentrated on three sandstone spurs in this very small uh, area, very small site. And here, the easily kept sandstones tend to weather rapidly through national processes, both on the surface and in deep horizontal and vertical fissures. This can lead to exfoliations and the detachment of blocks and large parts of the facade. The core area of the Camel site contains today 11, 12 known panels with the remains of 21 life size animal reliefs. In addition, two large uh, fragments of life size reliefs were recorded, as well as four small camels in bas reliefs and three small equids in eye reliefs. We have also identified several scatters of lithics. Among the 21 large animals in relief, 17 are camels, others are equids or unidentified. The animal carvings are generally life size and sometimes larger. The slide, this slide shows the most impressive panel. It is a stunning camel in high and low relief, high up on the soft uh, face of spur C. And as you can see, modern inscription and engra engravings have damaged the structure. The sculpture, unfortunately. The creation of the reliefs was a very time consuming process, and particularly the creation of more complex panels with two animal reliefs. Um, and for example, panel two is an engraved panel in low relief representing a dromedary in profile, raising its head towards a stunning equid to its right. This is the drawing, the bottom right. And you can see here the quality of the, uh, the carving, which is absolutely astonishing. These, uh, the animals are moreover represented in a walking attitude with one leg in front of the other. And this representation of movement is completed by a search for perspective. As seen, um, this, uh, this, is, okay, well, this is very apparent in the uh, legs of one side passing above those of the other side of the animal that you can see here on this slide. Another panel with a possible equid and what we identified as marks of PT found on the mammals' bodies in the shape of later dog elongated or circular cupules. The lifestyle size naturalistic reliefs at the camel site have been severely damaged by erosion. This, coupled with substantial destruction of the surrounding archaeological landscape, has made a chronological assessment of the site difficult. In order to get a broad understanding of the site and its age, we have developed a multidisciplinary strategy based on the research of many specialists. As seen here, a team specialized on rock varnish, led by Professor Andrea, provided new insights into the dating of the reliefs using non-destructive portable X-ray fluorescent on intact varnish on the sculptures and engraved petroglyphs, according to a method recently developed on the sites of Shuaimis, Juba, and Kilua. We have also launched a study by conservator and site management specialists in order to understand the erosion, the erosion factors and other destructions affecting the reliefs. Tool marks were identified by a stonemason on eight panels and the process of carving the release will need to have been done in two stages. In the first initial stage, the rock was shaped to bring out the relief, and on most reliefs, a substantial volume of rock was removed. A picking technique was used to create small but deep holes that separate the relief from this rock surface that was to be removed. 
The removal of sandstone was likely done using large scrap scrappers or hammers with stone chisels. In a second stage, the reliefs were, was shaped and the finer detail was carved. And as you can see here, we have conducted a kind of exper exploratory experiment with stone tools uh, to create a reference collection for the phraseological analysis. A small trench, a test trench was also uh, open in a area uh, underneath a small overhang between two rocky spurs to find, um, in order to find contextualized anthropic remains. And we have also collected sediment samples from underneath a panel fragment for all cell dating. This method measures when sediments were uh, last exposed, exposed to sunlight. When successful, this can give an age when the first fragment fell and thus give a minimum age for the creation of the reliefs for the Camel site. And thanks to these uh, research activities, we have now a good picture of the site, its age and function. In 2018, I suggested that a possible 2000 years old date for the reliefs, based on the only known comparison, the sick reliefs in Petra that we can see, and as we can see, it's very eroded also. And the results of our study now in 2021 have challenged this date, and we can rather uh, today give an age estimate, which is to the Neolithic era for the Camel site. Radiocarbon dating of bones found in the test range has indicated a Lexis millennium BC date. This corresponds to exhumed artifacts. The hairreds and beds made of various materials are obviously associated with the late Neolithic period. In the PXREF measurements at the camel site, clearly indicate the Neolithic age for the high relief camel and equids images as well, while OSL dating of sediments under two boulders provide a 3000 BP date for their collapse. All these age estimates are therefore very similar and coherent, permitting to suggest a late Neolithic date for the camel site and perhaps for the carvings of the reliefs. As a prehistoric rock art site, the function of the camel site remains difficult to assess. Concerning the technical evidence, it appears that large-sized animals of the camels site have required a strong investment of apparently local group and a high degree of skill of the artists. And for some of the, um, of the facades, we can imagine even the existence of two stairs for some areas, you can, as you can imagine. But in order to really understand the Camel site rock uh, reliefs, you must also take into account the fact that other large mammals, camels, but also equids and ibexes were carved life-size on the rock facades in Arabia. Some are really beautiful and naturalistic, as those shown here, qualified as large naturalistic engravings of camels, which were drawn by our colleagues Maria Grani. Many of these are found on Twitter, but are not pro uh, properly published. Although they require a complete detailed study, they were found all around the, and they were found all uh, this, um, these images around the Nafu Desert. These depictions are certainly related to the camel site through artistic and chronological aspects. Some of these depictions have the muscle intensely polished over time, and we also previously mentioned pupils at the camel site showing possibly marks of PT. It means that the camel site has probably a very symbolic um, um, objective. Most of these depictions show indeed male camels in roots, and therefore, we can, the camel site monumental figures were visible by the passerby, were certainly loaded not only with territorial property significance, but also with symbolic meaning. And the choice of the camel is not hazardous and reflects its high status, social status among the Arabian communities in the past. It is well known that dromedaries were much appreciated, appreciated animals throughout the Arabian Peninsula later during the pre-Islamic and Islamic periods as evidenced by epigram epigraphic material, the spectacular discovery discoveries of camel burials and the Arabic literature. Today, the most important issue for us is the preservation of the camel site. Unfortunately, the poor state of preservation requires urgent action. The first conservation step was to create a full 3D modeling of the panels on the site. The curved panels are strongly affected 
by natural factors, as you can see here. These natural factors cannot be stopped, but the panels can be protected by conservation measures such as consolidations and moving of the loose blocks. And another factor is, the, of course, anthropic destruction by bulldozer that affect many rock art and archaeological sites in KSA. A, fallen, a total of six fallen boulders are no longer in situ, and five of these have fallen to the ground. Of these, two boulders have subsequently been pushed around and damaged by bulldozing. And you see, this is a really a big problem. Some of the panels are also affected by del deliberate damaging and graffiti. This is difficult to avoid completely, uh, I agree, but site protection by the Heritage Commission is already an, es an essential first step. In addition, a local um, guard is mandatory in combination with information to the local community about the importance of the panels, for example, through information panels and education at school. One and a half minutes, uh, yes. Guillaume, please take care of the time. Thank you. In terms of preservation, three specialist conservator, uh, stonemason and site man management specialists have recently established a conservation protocol for each panel, which must be put into action. Measures include the consolidation of subsequent movement of blocks to positions where they can be better protected, but also the search for fragments and the reconstruction of reliefs in situ. Protection measures must include the building of structures to prevent further damage from wind erosion and water. It is clear that adequate protection that of this unique site, of this unique site, oh, sorry, of this unique site, um, sorry, um, will require considerable, considerable logistic and financial support from Saudi institutions. To conclude this lecture, we wanted here to highlight the exceptional character of the Clement site reliefs. A prehistoric age is now being considered with all the rock reliefs. And the sheer scale of communal, communal effort involved in its production, the site age and its likely symbolic use as a se seasonal meeting place are reminiscent of the status and scale of sites, sites such as Stone Age or Goblik Tepe. A large support is needed to protect this unique heritage for the future of Saudi Arabia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Guillaume. It was a very interesting uh, lecture about a very important uh, Saudi archaeological site. Now, I, I would like to introduce our third speaker, Professor Anthony Sinclair, uh, who will be presenting uh, a talk about the results of the Saudi British project along the Red Sea coastline and its relationship to human dispersals. Uh, Dr. Sinc Professor Sinclair. He is a professor of archaeological theory and method, uh, classics and Egyptology from the University of Liverpool, employed at the university since 1994. And he started this project in 2012 with Paleolithic surveys in Jezan, Asir province in Saudi Arabia, uh, originally as part of the Disperse uh, project. Uh, please, uh, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Abdullah. Can I just check that you can see the screen, please? Yes. Thank you. Um, just like um, with uh, Michael Petraglia, uh, this is a long program of work. And obviously, we would very much like to thank uh, everyone within Saudi Arabia, and in particular in the Heritage Commission, for the enormous help that we have received over the years. Um, I'm trying to uh, pack many years worth of work into a, a small number of slides. So I shall go relatively quickly, but hopefully we shall pick up some of the key elements. Um, just to give you a sense of our broad aims, the Dispersed Project is a joint Saudi-UK project. Uh, in Saudi, Dr. Abdullah Sherek from King Saud University is one of the directors. And in the UK, myself and Dr. Uh, Professor Jeff Bailey from the University of York are the directors. We are focused on the Red Sea coast, the coastal region, We've heard a lot previously about the extraordinary archaeology in the desert regions. For the Red Sea coast, there are a couple of key issues that are significant to us. The Red Sea coast is an active tectonic and volcanic landscape. It is a rough landscape that brings together enormous resources, and these will have been attractive to human occupants in the past. Along the coast, it provides access to coastal resources, and they will be abundant in terms of their quantity and diversity, 
both in terms of the immediate coastal area, but also in terms of the estuarine areas that flow into the coast. Many of those coastal resources will now have been lost to rising sea level. Saudi Arabia is an extraordinary place. It sits at the top of the African Rift Valley. And so we can see a continuity in terms of human action moving that way. Um, this slide briefly shows us that for the majority of time, um, human activity on the coast is now covered by a rising sea level. You can see at the top that just the green parts for our current climatic stage, for a stage about 80 to 125,000 years ago, and then earlier are visible presently. So the vast majority of human activity on the coastal region is now submerged underneath the rising sea level. If we were to think about how much land that we know was once uncovered but is now missing, um, recent work has suggested that that extent of land that is now covered occupied something like 20 million kilometers squared. That's roughly twice the area of Europe as it exists today. For our project, we have concentrated in two areas of the Red Sea coast so far, down in the south near Jizan and Asia, and briefly up in the north on the Gulf of Aqaba. I'll concentrate in the slides that follow down in the southern region. Um, one of the reasons that makes that such a, an interesting area for the point of view of human dispersals is that at times of lower sea level, uh, areas of coastal plain, but also a much shorter stretch of water would have been exposed across which people might have uh, crossed from Africa into Arabia. Um, we often think about the Bab al-Mendab, the narrowest part has been the place where people could cross. In fact, if we look a little bit further north, up into the Hanish Sill, we find areas where the water would have been much shallower, where there would have been islands, and it would have been possible to see where one was going from one place to another. Now, much of the work of the project has been about trying to reconstruct the landscapes, and there are three sorts of landscapes that we are looking at, one of which is the coast that is still visible. So those are the coasts that have not yet or not been covered by that rising sea level, and we're looking at evidence from the last 7,000 years for the most recent period. We still have elements of a coast that was visible or present during aspects of the Pleistocene. So there is a paleo coast and paleo coastal plain that we can look at. And then we have done our best to start to look at some of that submerged coastal area at times of the lowest sea level stand. If we take that first viewpoint, here we're looking at uh, the Farasan Islands, and we can see on the Farasan Islands both the modern shoreline, but also slightly raised an earlier shoreline. And in this slide, we can see a, a rock cut, cut coral reef deposit. And there is evidence of coastal occupation on this earlier coastline. When we're looking at the Paleo Coast, we can look at both coastal areas plus inland Paleo lakes. And we have done archaeological work that uses survey techniques and analysis and GPS and so forth there. For looking at the submerged coastal area, we have tried two approaches, one of which is to map that coastal area. So we have a sense of what may have been there and a sense of what might be available to look at. And we have used various forms of multi-beam and side-beam sonar to get a sense of what is out there. And where possible, we have also then done some underwater archaeology in shallow waters, looking at features of previous coastlines to begin to identify what sort of features and potentially archaeology we might find there. If we're to look at the scientific findings so far to date, I'll go through three things that relate to those types of coastline. I'll look a little bit at the Farasan Islands and tell you about what we know of the, the rich coastal community that lived there approximately 7,000 years before present. I'll tell you a little bit about what we can see on the Paleo coast, and then I'll tell you a little bit about what we have understood from that submerged coastline. So on the Farasan Islands, uh, we have been undertaking work there in fact, since about 2006, but extensively since 2012, and more than 3,000 shell mounds have been identified. 20 of them have been excavated. In the map, the red areas are both current and old coastlines, and that is where the shell mounds exist. 3,000 shell mounds puts the Farasan Islands right at the top of the league in terms of shell midden uh, sites. But the shell middens contain not just shells that are collected, but they also tell us from 
bones of fish and from animals about a complex life that is involving seafaring, going out and collecting deeper water fish, fishing in the shallows with nets, um, the gathering of shells also, but the hunting of gazelle on land. So this record is a tremendously rich one in terms of a recent coastal occupation. When we start to look at the Paleo Coast, uh, survey work that we have done has identified more than 150 locations of activity of uh, humans, hominins on the coastal area. These date to the Achillean, so the older Stone Age, as well as the Middle Stone Age or the Middle Paleolithic, as, as Mike would call it. And there are a range of locations that we have found this material in, many of them related to the uh, presence of basalt raw materials deriving from volcanic eruptions and so forth. The basalt provides abundant raw materials with which hominins can make their technology. I'll look at a couple of sites in particular, one of which is the site of Wadi Dahaban, which sits on a, an old paleo coast, and we'll see both evidence of the coast and of finds there. And then going a little bit inland, we have the site of Wadi Dabsa, that is a paleo lake situated within a volcanic basin. At both of these sites, we have lithic artifacts. Some of them we hope will be refitable. At the site of Wadi Dahaban, um, at the moment, the site is uh, originally a quarry. Material has been taken from there to help produce the road, which you can see at the bottom of the slide. The current post is about two miles beyond the road, down towards the bottom of the, the slide itself. But the site itself preserves that ancient coastline. You can see it in terms of the coral and the beach rock deposits. Within some of the beach rock deposits, we have found embedded stone tools, and we have optical stimulated luminescent states that tell us that this site dates between 135 and 85,000 years ago at that time of raised sea level. And the artifacts themselves are embedded within the rock deposits on the beach. At the site of Wadi Dabsa, a further inland, we are looking at a paleo lake that is now surrounded by the basalt outpourings of volcanic, um, volcanic cones. And here we have both the evidence of the Paleo Lake as well as human occupation. The artifact in the top right corner is an Achillean hand axe, a large one, published in 2017. Um, because the landscape is a tremendously varying landscape through time, so much of the work that we have engaged in is about trying to reconstruct that landscape. And for us, reconstructing that landscape is about determining the nature of the deposit with which archaeological finds are located, as well as understanding the build-up of the landscape around. And in this case, we have begun a program of dating of the basalt outcrops to get a sense of how the land has been created through the volcanic eruptions through time. And this is a landscape that is active at least from two million years ago and still active up to about a million years ago. Um, Wadi Dabsa has generated an assemblage of more than 1,500 artefacts, of which many of them I'm very sure will refit back together and tell us about the development of skill and technology in these communities. Um, we are still waiting on the dates from the tufa. The tufa itself here is the first tufa that has been uh, reported on the east side of the Red Sea coast and to the south of the Sinai. So it's an important paleoclimatic archive. For looking at the submerged coastlines, um, we've concentrated on two areas to try and get a sense of the nature of the coastline itself. One of those areas, area two, in the image above will have been a, a paleo channel on the coastal plain. The other one is areas that we believe would have been islands at the time of the lowest sea level stand. And the information that we have gathered here works upon the modern marine maps, but applies sonar. So here we're looking at those last glacial maximum islands that would have stood just off the coast of Saudi Arabia, as it would have been at the time of the lowest sea level. And we can see a series of islands with lagoons and shallows and rivers and so on, almost certainly a tremendously rich landscape for hominins to use. And if we go further in onto that coastal plain, we're looking at a river channel that drains from a paleo lake. This work is demonstrating that underneath the sea, going out, probably something like about 30 kilometers or so, there is an extraordinarily rich landscape that yet remains to be explored. So what are we going to do in future? Um, it's fair to say that work in Saudi Arabia is, is still in its infancy, I believe. And so there is an enormous amount of work that remains to be undertaken. I, I think it's reasonable to believe 
that we might see human occupation in the uh, in the kingdom from at least two million years ago, and certainly from one and a half million years ago. So that time of that active uh, Red Sea coast. So the work that we hope to continue in the future is to begin to reconstruct that developing landscape, doing further works to identify the sequence of eruptions of volcanic basalt that will provide the materials for hominins to use, to look for sites that provide those paleoclimatic archives that will tell us about the resources that were available, to look for obviously archaeological sites of older occupation. I'll give you some little tantalizing hints a little bit, I suppose, later on, and obviously to continue reconstructing some of the assemblages that we have generated so far. For the future, of course, the Red Sea coast is a tremendously active area in terms of the modern life of Saudi Arabia. And so we need to think about how we can map the resources there to help in terms of providing ways in which those resources can be protected for the benefit of the population in the future. Some of those will relate to the, the basalt outcrops and to the tufa deposits. And I hope that one of the key things that we shall do will be to generate databases of virtual artifacts, ones that we can scan to assist people across the kingdom in terms of helping them to identify these deposits themselves. Uh, I mentioned a couple of tantalizing instances. So here we're down near uh, the town of Sabia, just beyond Jazan, and we have found a, a couple of artifacts coming out of deep sections near roads. Uh, in the left, we're looking at the site of Jebel Aqua, where there is a date of an overlying volcanic deposit of approximately half a million years ago. Down deep in the section below that, we have a biface. And in Wadi Jazan, once again, another date on an overlying volcanic deposit of about 0.8 million years ago. And underneath that, we find old Stone Age uh, artifacts. So there is a tremendous amount that still remains to be done. And Saudi Arabia is still a, a, an extraordinarily exciting place to be working in. So just to finish off, I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues, uh, obviously Dr. Abdullah al Sharek, and all of the members of the Heritage Commission in Riyadh, Jazan, Asir, and Tabuk who have helped us, as well as colleagues who've come out from the UK, from York, Liverpool, Manchester, from Scotland, and European colleagues from the Hellenic Search Centre for Marine Research. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sinclair. And, uh... We appreciate keeping up with the time. Now we introduce our last but not least. Excuse me, doctor. Yes. Yes. Uh, all questions will be through the uh, Ministry of Culture YouTube channel where this uh, presentation is going to be done. So we hope that people send their questions uh, through it. Now we introduce our uh, last but not least uh, speaker, Professor Somi Uchi. Uh, professor Fuji yes. is a professor for human and social sciences from Kanazawa University in Japan. His research interests include archaeology. He, he is serving as an editorial member and member of several international journals. He has done field work in, in the Levant region and North uh, Saudi Arabia for many years, and he is the head of the Japanese mission in Tabuk. Professor Fuji, the floor is yours. Please proceed. Uh, Abdullah, can you see my slide? Yes, yes. Wadi Muharrag and Wadi Hubeya, ritual fields, Northwest Arabia. Yeah. Go ahead. So I would like to talk about the results of our recent investigations at the Wadi Muharrag and Wadi Gubai ritual field in Northwestern Arabia in this order. <clears throat> So, to begin with, uh, let us explain the outline of our project and the target site. As some of, some of you might know, we have long been working uh, in these uh, three research fields in an effort to trace the formation process of nomadic society in the Near East. Uh, Northern Hijaz is the third target. The Wadi Muhalak. Uh, Oh, sorry. Uh, the Wadi Muharak and Wadi Kubai site, our main concern today, is located uh, located about 50 kilometers northwest of Tabuk uh, province uh, capital. 
the Wadi Muharak sites are aligned along the eastern terrace of the Wadi of the same name. Meanwhile, the Wadi Gubai sites are dotted on the sandstone hills extending along the two upper tributaries of, of Wadi Gubai. Our research followed the standard survey and excavation method, and there's nothing special to add about this point. So let us uh, skip this chapter and directly proceed to the main subject. To date, uh, our surveys have located about, uh, in total uh, 19 ritual fees, four in the Wadi Muharak, and uh, oh, so two. Uh, four in the Wadi Muharak and 15 in the Wadi Gubai uh, drainage basin. They contain a total of 261 ritual structures, which fall into uh, these uh, six major types sealed settlement, or, uh, over sanctuary, and etc. In light of these observations, especially the second and third one, uh, they can be defined as richer rather than burial structures of early nomads. So uh, neither human bones nor burial gifts are found there. Let me explain them one by one. The earliest component is the linear settlement shaped open sanctuary, also called sealed settlement which is marked by the lateral connection of homogeneous uh, units, combining a rectangular structure and a small uh, round feature. Though poorly preserved, a good example was attested at Wadi Gubai 13. Another example found at uh, Wadi Gubai 11 produced uh, three uh, C14 dates, all of which fall within the second half of the late Neolithic. In view of, in view of the C14 dates and the typological sequence in the surrounding areas, the two cases attested at the Wadi Gubai site uh, can be taken as one of the final simplified form of seal settlement. The second earliest component is the oval sanctuary which produced two C14 dates falling within the late Neolithic calcolithic transitional period. Uh, this type of structure are marked by the oblique bond uh, technique common to a few structures at Smama. <clears throat> the U-shaped feature is constructed batting against exposed bedrock. Though lacking in direct evidence uh, such as C14 dates, this type of structures are always paired with the oval sanctuary and therefore can probably uh, be ascribed the same period. That is, uh, <coughs> namely uh, the late Neolithic, Calcolithic, transitional period. The, the niched enclosure is, is a connected form of an oval sanctuary and the U-shaped feature. The U-shaped feature is always incorporated into the easterly wall of the, the oval sanctuary, thereby uh, forming a sacred niche with a standing stone or stones. Uh, these these standing, standing stones can be taken as a, a symbolic substitute for exposed bedrock the core of the U-shaped feature. <clears throat> Next, uh, the niche platform can be taken as a freestanding form of the easterly wall of the standard, standard type of niche enclosure, falling into several subtypes, subtypes. Again, a standing stone or stones are arranged at the rear central floor of a niche. The tartum always coexists with the niche platform, but its origin is yet to be clarified. However, some of them are equipped with, a, with an external or internal niche. As you can see, 
uh, the, these photos, uh, these photos uh, suggesting, as in the case of the niche platform, some <clears throat> genealogical relationship with a niche enclosure. <clears throat> no C14 dates are available uh, for these three types of uh, ritual structures, but fortunately, uh, their niche were often reused as ad hoc uh, tombs in a later period. So uh, these various gifts related to the later reuse uh, provide their lower limit date. Uh, several C14 date derived from the reuse niches also suggest that the three types uh, ritual structures are earlier in date than the EB4 or MB1, and at the same time, later than the RD calculistic. From the above, uh, the series of ritual structures can be dated in this way. The 19 ritual fields combine them in, in various ways, falling into four groups according to their internal composition. It follows that what uh, by five of group three, for example, was continuously uh, continuously used from the late calculistic to the early Bronze Age. Understandably, the four groups are considered to have developed in this way, or in this way in more detail. <laughs> so, what can uh, so uh, what then uh, can we say from these new findings? First, in terms of the number of site and uh, site location, there seems mm, there seems uh, <coughs> to be a small gap between the early and the late calculistic. In view of the presence of distinct ritual cultures in the surrounding regions, this gap could be understood as an aspect of the demise and subsequent localization of the Neolithic ritual landscape represented by the pursuit settlement. Meanwhile, in terms of site area and the number of structures within the site, there's a large gap between the late Calcolithic and the early Bronze Age. This gap corresponds to the expansion of the tower tomb culture, suggesting uh, the establishment of a full-fledged full -fledged nomadic society in Northern Hijaz. As for future issues, uh, we are planning full-scale investigation at Wadigubai 20. In light of the chronology in the Nefu desert, most of the recorded uh, petroglyphs are estimated to date back to the Bronze Age. If so, uh, they are expected to provide a glimpse into everyday life of local nomads who constructed the neighboring ritual field. Another candidate uh, of our future investigation is Panzer Traps, uh, concentrated around Wadi Gubai 20 just mentioned. <clears throat> Similar devices in the lower Jordan Valley are dated to the early Bronze Age on the basis of OSL dating. If the same applied to our, our cases, they would also provide fresh insights into the mundane aspect of the Tower Tomb culture. It is our immediate issue to explore the, the overall picture of the Wadi Muharak and the Wadi Gubai site through these complementary investigations. In addition, uh, an enlarged excavation at Wadigubai 6A North potentially shed new light on the origin of the neighboring Bronze Age fortified town of Gulaya. We would like to continue our research in cooperation with, uh, with the Saudi Arabian and Australian teams. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Fuji, and uh, that's a very uh, good timing for the talk. 
Uh, if I may start the questions in reverse, and uh, if you are with us, uh, Professor Fuji, I'd like to ask you uh, this question. Uh, where would you say the early civilization started in Arabia? And how are your uh, fieldwork findings relate to the uh, initial uh, results of the work that has been done by Dr. Khalid al Asmari in the site of Al Uyayna? Uh, well, your first question is beyond my ability. You know that I'm specialist in Neolithic and uh, calculus case, so I, I I know a little about the civilization. But I can I can I can tell uh, the uh, prehistoric uh, situation. Okay. Uh, the second question is ab about. How how your findings are related to the uh, uh, the site of Al Uyayna mm -hmm. in Tabuk, the site of Al Uyayna. What do you mean? You know the site of Al Uyayna. Uyayna. Yes. Ah yeah yeah I understand. That uh, uh, very important very very important site that, and maybe uh, PPNB as settlement. Uh, you know that we excavated uh, another PPNB settlement uh, along the let's uh, say coast, what Shalba one. Maybe the uh, I, 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 uh, followed uh, it and uh, maybe belong uh, belong to the late PPNB, late PPNB period. And that's very 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 important. <clears throat> and and uh, you know the, uh, I introduced the late Neolithic uh, settlement. In my lecture, so the Al Ayena just uh, uh, how to say was followed by this uh, late Neolithic seal settlement. That means uh, the pastoral normalization begins after Al Ayena. I think so. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Professor uh, St. Clair. Hello. Yes, uh, a question uh, for you. Uh, how do you see the uh, the uh, alignment or the correlation between the findings along the uh, Red Eastern Red Sea coastlines and what has been found uh, in the center of Arabia? How do these uh, Findings correlate with each other or complement each other. So, so I, I, I believe they complement each other very, very strongly. Um, obviously, at the moment, uh, Saudi Arabia has experienced tremendous climate change, and there are time periods when it's uh, an, an extremely difficult country to live in due to the aridity. I think in both of our uh, projects at the moment, what we are demonstrating is that at times when either humidity is higher when there is greater rainfall or at times when uh, the coast is resources are, are accessible for us to see we can see that humans are very active and visible within Saudi Arabia um, the biggest issue I suppose we have at the moment is being able to understand where those humans are either within the kingdom itself or more broadly at times when uh, the climate is much drier I think in both of our cases we are not yet accessing deposits that are either of that time period or that the archaeological remains that we are finding cannot yet be dated to it. Um, my personal uh, belief would be that I think it is likely that humans are still within Saudi Arabia and they're likely to be in places that we would talk of as being refugial areas where the climate remains more hospitable for human occupation. But I think both of us yet have, have that sort of material to find as yet. But at the moment, they are, they are complementary. Thank you very much. Now we come to uh, Dr. Charlo. Uh, the question is, uh, does the Camel site have any relationship to other sites in North Arabia? And how many people do you think worked uh, and did these engravings? Yeah. Um, well, concerning the, the fact that the Camel site is very unique, and it's like a UFO in, in, in the, all the Middle East, but at the same time, there is really uh, clear relationships with many other uh, uh, 
um, rock art sites in Arabia. It has links with the, what I showed you with large naturalistic uh, representations of camels, but it has also relationship, but in a very long, long terms of um, uh, long um, time periods with the um, with the um, representations of camels that you can find also very large size camels that you can find also for the historical periods, which are much less detailed, but very, uh, very interesting also. And then you can really see a kind of mini traditions following one each other to each other in the North Arabia. For the second uh, questions, I've seen that my colleague uh, Maria Guanyin is here with us. So uh, Maria, do you want to, to say a few words? It would be fine to, to have you here with us. Um, sure. Uh, hi. Uh, did, did you just want me to address uh, sort of in, in, in general uh, uh, the importance? Yeah, concerning yeah, how yeah. many, how many, how many, many people. people. Um, okay. Um, yeah. Well, the, 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 the stonemason we had in the team, he reckoned uh, most likely you would use two people to, um, to carve the panels. Um, uh, because there's two very different elements in carving it. Uh, one is sort of the removal of sort of large bulks of the of the stone to get the sort of overall uh, three dimensional uh, uh, properties, and then the second job is a is a very different uh, one and requiring requiring different skills where you then shape sort of each and on, on, uh, of the, the the individual parts to make them to make them naturalistic, um, uh, and often. Uh, at least in modern contexts, often that would be sort of like a master and an apprentice sort of situation. Whether that was the case in the Stone Age, we don't know. But we do assume that there was at least two people working on them um, because that would make sense in sort of in terms of sharing the, the task. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Betraglia. Uh, there is a question. Could there have been a reverse migrations back from Arabia to Africa? And what are the pressing questions that you have in mind in for future work in the in the in, in Saudi? Mike, are you with us? Mike? I think he's left, Doctor. Okay, so I think uh, by that, I think we come to conclude uh, this session. And we thank all uh, the esteemed colleagues and uh, His Excellency, the Vice Minister, the, uh, and uh, the CEO of the Heritage Commission for uh, their presentations and we thank you and we conclude this session. Thank you very much. It's uh, the mic to you, Abdullah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we have a break now. We will see you inshallah at two o'clock by real time inshallah. Thank you.
السلام عليكم دكتور ماجد مرحبا يا دكتور جاهز؟ اي جاهزين ان شاء الله مين معك؟ الدكتورة مارتا روملو ارنولف دكتورة صبا اي ان شاء الله اوكي جست سكند بليز السلام عليكم ومرحبا بكم مرة أخرى نرحب بكم في الجلسة الثانية عن أثار وثقافة الواحات القديمة والتي نستعرض فيها أبرز الأعمال الأثرية في عدد من المواقع الأثرية رئيس الجلسة الدكتور ماجد العنزي متخصص في الأثار القديمة يعمل في هيئة التراث والدكتور ماجد رئيس الفريق السعودي في المشروع السعودي الألماني في موقع تيمة بالإضافة إلى عدد من الأبحاث الميدانية له عدد من المقالات المتخصصة في أثار وثقافة الواحات القديمة دكتور ماجد تفضل الآن باستعراض المحاضرين في هذه الجلسة شكرا لك Good afternoon everyone Welcome to the second session for the online forum about the archaeological discoveries in Saudi Arabia We have in this session four speakers Let me go through a quick roll to check if they are online now. Yeah, maybe Dr. Arnold will join us after a few minutes. So the first uh, uh, speaker in this uh, session is Dr. Marcia, uh, Marta Lochani. She's associate professor of archaeology and history of the ancient Near East at Vienna University. She obtained her PhD from uh, Oriental Institute of the University of Naples, Italy, and a postgraduate uh, specialization in, near, uh, in ancient Near Eastern archaeology at the University of Pisa, Italy, with a long-lasting experience in archaeological field work since 1991. Since 2015, she heads field work in Korea and Tabuk region. She published numerous uh, scientific articles and many book chapters. Dr. Marta, mic is yours you've got 15 minutes thank you very much i will uh share my screen can you please tell me if it's working and if you can hear me yes it's clear and we hear you perfect so thank you very much much uh, dr majid thank you very much uh, dr abdallah i will be speaking about uh, the urban oasis of Koraya and I will give you a short report on the first six excavation campaigns. So uh, as everybody else, I will give an overview of the project, of our methods, our uh, most um, uh, important results and future orientations. So let me start by saying that the multidisciplinary archeological investigations of Koraya are a joint project of the University of Vienna in cooperation with the Heritage Commission and it is really my pleasure to thank not only His Excellency uh, Prince Bader, but also Dr. Jasser uh, Al Herbish, Dr. Abdullah Zahrani, uh, for their uh, unstinting uh, support in all these uh, years. And uh, let me also uh, um, uh, give a, a special note of thank uh, to uh, my cooperation par partner, Ahmed Abul Hassan for uh, succeeding in uh, developing a fantastic cooperation. We are really very, very happy about our joint work. And as far as uh, the, uh, our techniques, uh, it is very important. Uh, we uh, decided to um, carry out a controlled systematic stratigraphic excavation combined with state-of-the-art interdisciplinary research. This means uh, landscape reconstruction, 
um, Mike Petralia said how important it is. Uh, and we do this through remote sensing, drone surveying, high resolution uh, digital elevation models, geomorphology, microstratigraphy, hydroarchaeology. Of course, we want also to reconstruct floral, faunal, and human landscape uh, through paleobotany, archaeozoology, and bioarchaeology. And we have um, special interest in artifact analysis with archaeometry, neutron act activation analysis, especially, uh, especially for pottery but also archaeometallurgy, OSL and radiometric dating, and beads analysis are some of the major aspects. So an overview of the site is uh, quickly uh, done. Um, you know that Kuraya is one of the largest and most significant oasis in Arabia, and it lies uh, uh, east of the Hizma range, so at the eastern foothills of the Hijaz, some 60 kilometers south of the modern Jordan uh, Saudi Arabian border, and 120 kilometers east of the eastern shores of the Red Sea, and the altitude is uh, more or less 800 meters above sea level. And undoubtedly, uh, it must be regarded as one of the oldest and most widespread architectural landscapes in the uh, desert of the peninsula. Al Ghazi proposed uh, an association with the capital of the Midianites, a people mentioned in the Bible and classical sources in the Quran and uh, an identification with the classical period site of Ostama, mentioned in Ptolemy's geography, has been put forward by Musil, but we don't have any further information on this. And Kuraya has been observed and described by travelers in the past, in 1906 by Bernhard Moritz, and in 1956 by St. John Philby. But uh, then there have been some surface surveys um, by Peter Parr in 68 and later in the frame of the uh, very important Saudi Arabian comprehensive survey by Ingraham and others in 1980. Um, and the German archaeological team was uh, surveyed the site in 2008 and 9. And in those same years, also Kixo University excavated in two areas. So in 2014, uh, the University of Vienna, in cooperation with the Saudi Heritage Commission, started the first, as we said, systematic multidisciplinary investigations of the site. And in September, we just carried out our sixth excavation season. So Kuraya is the widest archaeological settlement encircled by a continuous wall ever documented in the Arabian Peninsula. It is a walled megasite of over 300 hectares. And it is made of different units. You can see them. I hope you can see my pointer. A 50 meter high plateau in the southwest, a low lying connected area right here, the red part, and a mud brick walled residential area to its northeast here. And then, of course, the large expanse of the agricultural fields and canals. The Saudi Austrian mission could establish the foundation of the permanent settlement of Kuraya, not the first, but the permanent settlement, is to be dated to a significantly older date than previously thought. The settlement was made possible by a sophisticated system of exploitation of surface water from the Wadi Gubai. So Kuraya was a human-made river oasis, not an underwater natural oasis. We discovered continuous settlement in Kuraya in the entire third, second, and first millennium uh, Cal BCE with no gaps in occupation and not, as was thought and written in the past, just Midianite and Nabataean presence. And now we can also prove that the famous Midianite pottery, we now call it standard Kuraya painted ware, was invented in Kuraya already around 1500 uh, Cal BCE. We also found the first intact burials of the final Late Bronze Age, Oops, sorry, um, what has been previously called uh, the Midianite uh, period. So uh, let me go to the, um, just a brief, a quick mention of our scientific methods. Uh, as I said, the priority was establishing a reliable scientific uh, chronology for the site. And so we started a systematic sampling of organic remains for radiometric measuring. 
And this is what has allowed us to prove that the oasis existed from the first half of the third millennium calibrated BCE down to the first century uh, calibrated BCE continuously with no interruptions in the sediment history. And on land, landscape and irrigation structures where organic samples are absent, we use the optically stimulated luminescence or OSL to obtain a date. And on the lower right, you see um, uh, uh, an ex ex uh, explanation of how the system works. The important uh, aspect is that the result, results from the two methods, from C14 and um, OSL, match uh, each other and so they present a coherent picture of the chronology of the site. The paleoenvironmental reconstruction was crucial for understanding the origins and also the sustainability of life in the river oasis of Kraya. So uh, through remote sensing, high resolution 3D modeling, geomorphology, hydroarchaeology, we are mapping the water and irrigation structures that enabled life on the site. And we are doing this in cooperation with the University of Natural Sciences in Vienna, the Hoku Wien, uh, Kanazawa University in Japan, and the Freie Universität Berlin in Germany. So in the early third millennium uh, KBCE, the first settlers created a permanent um, walled megasite in Korea by retaining and diverting water from the Wadi Gubai two kilometers south of the sediment. Furthermore, through detailed and combined analysis of osteological remains, we are conducting paleopathological studies with the Austrian Archaeological Institute, stable isotope analysis with Max Planck Institute in Vienna, and inch DNA with Harvard Medical School of Genetics. And we are integrating the, the, with, this, with this research and the reconstruction of the ancient environment with the analysis of the past human landscape. And through analysis of the archaeological remains with the Austrian Archaeological Institute, we are reconstructing the ancient faunal landscape on the site. And through the analysis of the paleobotanical remains with the German Archaeological Institute, we are adding the ancient flora to these multiple landscapes. As far as artifact analysis, I will just mention two uh, main projects. One is called P Networks, and it's a specific geometric program on the analysis of pottery throughout all attested periods in Korea. And we want to compare, we want to fingerprint, uh, chemically fingerprint uh, um, this uh, material and compare it with pottery from Jordan and the Southern Levant. And this we are doing in cooperation with the Harvard Museum of the Ancient Near East, uh, with MIT's Center for Material Research and in Archaeology and Ethnology, with the Atom Institute of the Technical University in Vienna, the uh, Austrian Archaeological, uh, University, um, Archaeological Institute, the Freie Universität Berlin, uh, Chao Chak Wing Museum of the University of Sydney, and the University of Innsbruck. And also we have a special program on archaeometallurgy in cooperation with BIAS uh, of the University of Vienna. We are trying to establish composition and provenance of copper ore smelted on Koraya's plateau in the late third millennium Cal BCE. So what are our most prominent scientific results? I mentioned this already that the new radiometric measurements tell us that Koraya was constructed at the two monumental walls on top of the plateau, the engaged round tower, and the entire city wall um, must have been undertaken at the latest, at the latest, in the first half of the third millennium Cal BCE. And I said these dates correspond very well to OSL measurements that we obtained on different locations in and off site in the Wadi Gubai Dam. Uh, in the canal that we have on the plateau, in the uh, at the foot at the, of the plateau, and in the uh, on the inlet and outlet of the, our city wall. So, therefore, the foundation of Koraya as a permanent walled mega site with well structured layout is over 1,000 years older than previously thought. Confirmation of the importance of the settlement of Koraya in the early Bronze Age is brought by the presence of a monument, monumental multiple burial on top of the plateau in the direct proximity of the round tower. And it's 
BCE dates range from the 26th to the 24th century calibrated BCE, and it contains hundreds of beads and Southern Levantine style pottery. At the end of the third millennium, uh, the tower became the location for metallurgical production uh, through um, smelting and melting of arsenic copper and in situ production of metal artifacts. And the provenance of the metal ore seems to point to a supply region different from the expected Wadi Fainan, so either Oman or Arabian Shield. Contemporary with the uh, arsenic copper production on top of the plateau in areas B and C, we found two burial chambers that are used down to the Middle Bronze Age, and they seem to contain different populations. Possibly one of them was for the artisans working to produce copper on the site. But gifted craftspeople were active also slightly later in the initial Late Bronze Age. And at this time, a large pottery production is initiated in area A in Koraya. And this is when the idea of the so-called uh, standard Koraya painted ware was born on the site. Late Bronze Age standard Koraya painted ware is an assemblage with simple ware, but uh, most prominently bichrome and monochrome painted vessels with both figurative and geometric designs. Very prominent are depictions of animals such as the lion, the ibex, and other quadrupeds, and you can see them on the lower hand side, right hand side. Um, standard Koraya painted ware production carried out on an almost industrial scale at the site echoes but never imitates contemporary productions of the bichrome era, such as chocolate and white from Jordan, Levantine and Cypriot bichrome wares, and even the Egyptian New Kingdom painted pottery. In area R, we could excavate in the, for the final late Bronze Age down to the uh, initial Iron Age, so to the, from the 13th to the 10th century a calibrated BCE multiple burials and they contain agate, carnelian, rock crystal, mother of pearl pendants, stone, glass paste, faience and shell beads, ostrich egg, bronze pins, iron bracelets and arrowheads and two Egyptian scarabs. Excuse me, Martha, yes. please uh, conclude in one minute, please. Thank you. In one minute. Oh, okay. So, I will just show you the um, uh, the further uh, um, um, evidence we have for the um, entire Iron Age, and you can see the objects. Uh, we have again some Egyptian imports and local pottery. The um, gist of the entire um, of the entire um, of my presentation is to say that we really have a, a continuously uh, occupied uh, settlement. Um, and the future trends uh, for, for, uh, for the future are that we want to investigate uh, the beginning, before the beginning, basically, the Neolithic and Catholic phases. We have a very interesting um, statue that belongs to this phase that we, are, we have been investigating and comes from the plateau next to uh, Raya. Uh, and so this will be one direction we will be going into and also the other direction will be investigating more in depth the um, um, epigraphic and petroglyphic uh, repertory that is very strongly uh, attested in on the site. Um, and with this, I conclude my, my uh, communication. Thank you, Dr. Marta. Uh, the second speaker for this uh, session is Dr. Uh, Romello Loreto, associated professor at the University of uh, Naples uh, for archaeology and art history of the Arabian Peninsula and ancient Near East. Uh, since 2011, he is head of Italian component of the Saudi Italian archaeological uh, project at Domitel Jandal in Al Jof region. Uh, initiated by the late Alessandro Di Marie. Uh, in 2017, he published uh, a monograph of the archaeology of Arabian and, and Italian language. Dr. Romel Romello, mic is yours. Hi. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished colleagues. Good afternoon. 
So since 2009, this uh, long durée joint project led by the University of Naples Orientale and Saudi Ministry of Culture is conducting archaeological research activities in the oasis of Dumatalgiana. Okay, and the region of Al Jof, of course. The project activities here briefly overviewed stretch from the excavation to the surveys and from training to restoration, as well as study of the materials. More recently, intensive remote sensing activities took place for the census of the Aljof archaeological heritage and study of paleo landscapes, that is the transition from green Arabia to the emergency of the oasis as a cultural landform. The oasis of Dumatal Jandal revolves around the historical core and archaeological area focused on the main buildings such as the Marid Castle, the so-called Umar Mosque, and the Abdira medieval village, as well as the extensive Nabatean settlement. The history of the oasis take form from the 8th century BC when it was known as Adumatu in the Assyrian sources. It stands as one of the most significant historical sites of the Arabian Peninsula, since its role as caravan trade in Northern Arabia and its involvement in the Assyrian warfare when the kings of Kedar and the queens of the Arabs were able to stand the Assyrian imperialism in Arabia. Thus, Dumat al Jandal is the pivot of the Al Jof region, a complex scenario characterized by different environments and cultures from prehistory to the advent of Islam. For such reason, the project is, still, is going on with a detailed mapping of the Al Jof heritage within an archaeological map based on both census of the antiquities and the definition of the synchronic paleo landscapes. An archaeological project is characterized, of course, by multidisciplinary. Uh, a multidisciplinary profile. Thus, of course, it involves several expertise and methodologies. First of all, the usage of GIS platforms as general repository of any archaeological and geotopographical data that are constantly updated. On this regard, uh, starting from the prehistorical periods, of course, study of lithic artifacts uh, is of great importance for the datings of prehistoric context when uh, ground checking is not available and with also archaeometric analysis. Of course, uh, and last but not least, the geoarchaeological approach is a paramount for the definition of paleo landscapes. On this regard, remote sensing or photo interpretation on both natural RGB color and false color Landsat thematic map is providing extremely useful support for the detection of paleo landforms and related archaeological sites. Coming to the excavation and material studies inside the oasis, also here topographical reliefs and remote sensing on high definition images provide a GIS archaeological map for the recording of any element. Regarding the recording strategies, among many, also 3D modeling for uh, museum uh, edutainment uh, purposes is going on. Um, excavation in the historical oasis. Uh, coming to the most prominent results, are focusing around the Marid Castle, the ancient Acropolis, where a detailed stratigraphic and occupational sequence dated from the 8th century BC up to nowadays was brought to light. Indeed, the paramount topic has been the one related to the identification of material evidence of the ancient Arab quoted in the Assyrian sources. The excavation out outside the, west, the western side of the Umar Mosque revealed an assemblage and a massive building remains related to the 8th, 7th century BC, late Neo-Assyrian period, that for the first time confirms the identification of Dumat al Jandal as the ancient Adumatu and attests material evidence contemporaneous to the tribe of Kedar and the first Arabs. In addition, archaeometric data and material culture also suggest a link with the Tema and beyond to the Levant and Mesopotamia once again, and continuous occupation up to the Nabatean era, when the archaeological evidence is uh, more abundant. Nabatean structures and contemporaneous Roman and partial imports, as well as luxury Nabatean wares, are uh, attested all over the site. Indeed, starting from the first century BC, the oasis shows rich imported materials, among many also um, Rhodian ware. All of them define a portrait of an oasis that benefits from the Roman province Arabia and trade with the Levant. 
Still in the pre-Islamic era, evidence of the richness of the oases are quite clear. Example of mosaic from the Marid castle dated to the 6th and 7th century uh, show a Byzantine phases uh, that uh, uh, precede the conquest by the Islamic Ummah. In this overview, one would like to introduce just some of the, and the consolidation procedures applied inside the historical core of the oasis, in particular in the excavation of the Assyrian and Abatian settlement obliterated by the Omar Mosque. The operational procedures uh, and follows the end list uh, of Dumat al Jandal in UNESCO tentative list, with some intervention focused uh, on the um, conservation of floors, mud brick floors and walls, in particular uh, the retaining walls base to prevent further collapse. Coming to the future orientation of the project, it must be said that the last two seasons allow to introduce new main results regarding the extensive study of the wall Aljov heritage by mapping the impressive number of prehistoric sites and to better define the Assyrian phase of Adumatu. So in light of the most recent data collected, several future developments can be contemplated. Among many, to proceed with the definition of the Aljov Paleo landscapes by mapping extensively the prehistorical evidence. A huge amount of evidence indeed has been mapped in the Aljov region, mostly Neolithic and Bronze Age, in the Harat al Harra at Tawil Formation, along the Wadi Sirhan and east of Sakaka. The Quantum GIS project's repository includes 15,775 records updated to December 2020 and still daily progressing. This immense heritage finds place in a paleoclimate model well known when Arabia experienced a climate radically different from the current one. This climatic moist conjuncture reached its climax between 10,000 and 8,000 years ago. Back then, even the northernmost areas of the peninsula, the Great and the Ford Desert, and the volcanic fields of the Arhat al Harra would benefit from an optimal pluvial and hydrological regime. By applying the photo interpretation, in particular the false color Landsat um, imagery, and the study of composition of the soils uh, and the, the recognition of anthropic microstructures, it is possible to identify these stone structures in the paleo environment, mostly characterized by what is today a rocky desert of volcanic origin, precisely the basaltic expanses of the Harat which occupy a larger part of the western flank of the Arabian Peninsula. The very first record of such stone structures is, dates back to 1927. Um, and of course, uh, thousands of structures with strange walls have been known since then, and they dot the regions from southern Turkey to Yemen through Syria, Jordan, and the entire western reach of the Arabian Peninsula. The example shown here focuses on the areas of relevance of the project. Therefore, it examines the extension of the Arat al Harra within the borders of the North Arabian and Al Jov Saudi region. It is therefore useful to define with a high degree of accuracy what is the real area affected by volcanic phenomena, which gave life to soils of peculiar nature that were uh, chosen from these. Uh, human and anthropic community. This approach only for the Jov region has made it possible to record architectural evidences referable to the millennium between 8,000 and 6 to 4,000 BC. In particular, uh, we defined agglutinate structures, proto or pseudo villages, 9,046 units, compounds, more than 4,000 units, 156 desert guides and more than 7,000 uh, single shelters. Finally, uh, circa 2,500 uh, graveyards or tombs. Still regarding the remote sensing that brought to light not only prehistoric evidence, but also plausible new historical sites, plans are to go on with the analysis and ground check of those plausible sites referred to the historical era located during the last remote sensing survey. In particular, this one uh, located along the Wadi Arsirhan course in a clo close proximity to uh, ITRA. 
and probably related to the late pre-Islamic or early Islamic period. And the second one relate, um, located to the north northeast of Sakaka um, in the direction of Mesopotamian North Arabian trade routes. So um, since it is uh, far north to the Darb Zubaydah, the Abbasid uh, Piglin roads, in all probability, we are facing here a new uh, historical first millennium BC caravan road uh, site. Finally, um, the plans are to proceed with ex extensive excavation in Dumat al-Jandal that still has much to reveal. The proceeding of the pottery study from previous excavation as well, are, as, well as new excavations, in particular at al sunaymiyat is revealing new Assyrian ware occurrences. Abundant is the material emerged from a first systematic investigation of al sunaymi Yat, where an ancient Nabataean necropolis is supposed to be located. On the contrary, since 2009, uh, a huge amount of uh, um, Assyrian pottery is coming to light. After a first campaign during which 20 test probes were opened between uh, the historical core and the western enclosures, Surprisingly, an amount of the same Neo-Assyrian tradition where emerged from the historical core was collected. Thus, one has to consider either these materials should be referred to funerary, dismantled context, or to daily life activities that suggest to quite enlarge the extension of the Assyrian urban area far beyond the foot of the Acropolis. Also, 13 years of activities allowed to collect more than 120,000 among pottery elements and objects that needs proper study and restoration. Last but not least, restoration activities will go on with the field intervention after the 2020 remote sensing season devoted to the monitoring of rain, humidity and vegetal issues that can affect the stability of the excavated structures. Such monitoring took place tech, thanks to the usage of satellite high definition infrared images programmed to detect the presence of chlorophylla at a scale of 30 centimeters, allowing us by remote to prepare the next consolidation procedures that right now are going on. In conclusion, Dumat al Jandal still has much to reveal within the extraordinary oasis itself, as well as concerning its links with wider context of the ancient Near East. Thus, more proposal will follow from our side. And so for all the above, I am and we are grateful to our uh, Saudi colleagues on the field, uh, most of all among many Darhan al Kahtani, Ahmed al Gayed, Tamer al Malki, Aid al Kahtani, Nasser al Gureibi, Khalifa Rueli, Ahmad Shamari, and of course to Dr. Abdallah al Zahrani and to Dr. Jasir al Erbish for all your support uh, in every stage of the work. Thank you and greetings from Dumat al -Jandal. Thank you, Dr. Rosello. Um, just to remind the audience that the discussion related to a uh, decision will be after the fourth uh, presentation. The third speaker in this session is Dr. Leiter. He is the head of the archaeological Archaeology and Arabia section in German Archaeological Institute in Berlin. Since 2004, he has been working at the Oasis of Taima in Tabuk region. He obtained his PhD from Munich University. He has been teaching at the very University of Berlin near Eastern Archaeology since 1997, as well in, uh, as in several other Arabian, uh, uh, Arabian uh, universities, such as Hagen, Vienna, Venice, and Badla. He authorized uh, and uh, co edited seven books and published more than 90 scientific articles. Welcome, Dr. Arnold. Uh, Mike is yours. Dr. Arno? Dr. Arnov, could you please? Yeah. Open yes, the mic. here. So sorry, I just had to uh, switch on my microphone. Okay. And here's my presentation. One minute. Sorry. 
So you can see something. Hello. Uh, not yet. Hello. Hello, Dr. Arno. Do you hear me? Yes, you can hear me. Yes. Okay, I have to. There was a mess here. Okay, one minute. Do it for you. You can, can see, see the presentation, presentation now. now. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, okay, so, so um, I, I hear myself twice. twice. Can, you Can you hear me twice, twice or once? once? Can you hear me? Yeah, you can continue. Okay, okay. so, so dear, dear, uh, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, and gentlemen dear, dear friends and colleagues, and colleagues thank, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this conference. conference. I shall I talk, talk about the oasis of Tema, archaeology and environment theory landscapes. landscapes. And, and I'm actually as working at Tema with my team. And when I asked uh, Majid Al Anisi whether he would like to join, he said, um, "No, I'm the chairman." So I just want to underline that what I'm presenting now is the work of a team composed of Saudi and German and international colleagues at Tema. So let's go. Okay, the four main topics you know, so I just go on and we start with the overview of the project and the archaeological site. The Oasis of Tema is one of the major oasis settlements in Northwestern Arabia. And I don't read to you all what is written here, but what I should point out is that the earliest human presence at the site has been dated to the late Neolithic based on surface finds. Oasis cultivation is attested as early as 7,250 years before today with grapevine and figs, whereas uh, the date palm, as well as the domestic dromedary, one of the key features of the Arabian Peninsula, are attested as late as in the late Bronze Age. However, and this have we have heard in other presentations today, um, already at the transition from the fourth to the third millennium, a pottery producing community inhabited the settlement which is characterized by a monumental building in the center of the settlement and a large wall system of slightly later date. Evidence for contact with the Levant and Egypt is uh, tested as early as in the early to Middle Bronze Age. And here is just to mention this pharaonic inscription of Ramesses III, some 60 kilometers southwest of Pema. We talk about Nabonidus later on, but this is um, a historical event which characterized for many years the understanding of Tema uh, in particular in Northwestern Arabian oasis in general. Um, the history of excavations at Tema is quite long. So the Deputy Ministry of Antiquities Museum started as early as in 1979, excavating Casa al Hamra, Casa al Radim, and the walls. It shifted then its attention to the cemeteries until uh, in 2004, a Saudi Arabian German collaborative project by the SCTH and the German Archaeological Institute has been carried out multidisciplinary investigations on the oasis settlement and the paleo environmental context with more than 15 national and international partner institutions. Currently, an interdisciplinary project of the Heritage Commission and the DII investigates the funeral landscapes of the oasis in the Bronze Age in the area of Rujum Sasa. And of course, we should, um, next to the uh, endless support of the Saudi authorities, mentioned that the German component has been funded by the German Research Foundation. So general factors characterizing the oasis is the presence of a modern settlement and large areas covered by a modern agricultural area. So the oasis landscape is quite of a palimpsest. Just some other fact and figures. The walled oasis um, measures 9.2 square kilometers extension and there's a 75 hectares archaeological core area. Excavations in the settlement revealed 12 major occupation periods from the Neolithic to present time. 
more than 40 uh, archaeological zones have been protected by the local antiquities office. And as I stated before, our investigations were archaeological, paleoenvironmental, and we're focusing at the same time on preservation and presentation strategies. And in fact, here's just some uh, information about the latter. Uh, one uh, large building of historical significance has been fully um, restored, not reconstructed. And uh, a video and a publication uh, report on uh, these measures, which have accompanied our work for more than 10 years. If you come to the techniques and scientific means used in the scientific project, uh, one could mention many aspects, but I will focus um, luckily on the number of folds, uh, slides which were offered by the um, presentation offered by HC. What uh, was of foremost importance was, of course, the paleontological research. The Paleo Lake north of the, uh, of the oasis has been investigated by means of core drilling and uh, especially paleontological, archaeobotanical, geoarchaeological and biogeochemical research um, has carried, has provided by means of multi-proxy analysis, a reconstruction of the climate, as well as what I already mentioned before, the um, beginning of oasis cult cultivation at around 7,000 kbp. Current research on the chronology of the agricultural cultivation at Tema is ongoing in the frame of the ground track project. And the section here to the right on the bottom is just something we did some days ago in the Sebran. Another aspect, of course, is hydrology. We have heard about different types of oases already before. So Tema is a groundwater oasis, and the presence of water was never a problem. Many wells have been identified and irrigation. Here you see a photograph of the first main BC irrigation system. Irrigation may have been uh, introduced as early as in the fourth millennium, and we are currently refining the chronology of these early traces of agricultural irrigation. An aspect which uh, is related to Saudi excavations as well as the Saudi German project is archaeometallurgy. And the weapons which have been excavated by Mahmoud al Hajari uh, in Sanae in 2003, as well as other weapons of both expeditions, have been analyzed from either the early to middle Bronze Age as well as of the Iron Age. And as in other cases in the region, the copper or the metal um, provision of metal, providing of metal, by the, characterized by the fact that at Tamer there was no sign of any metal production, it seems that the site has been choosing from several options uh, in obtaining raw materials from various parts, parts of the Raymond Peninsula. Um, and most recent uh, research project uh, by Barbara Huber uh, refers to the tracing of incense and the smells caps of the oasis of Tema and by uh, gas chromatography mass spectrometry and lipid chromatography mass spectrometry, she has been investigating uh, a diachronic set of samples from various um, incense burners. And um, frankincense, myrrh, and passia, pistachia resin have been identified in different contexts and in different chronological periods, which means in some that Tema was not only a hub for trading incense, but uh, incense or uh, fence played a part of the ancient life in the oasis. So they, uh, the substances were fired uh, on the site or at Tema itself. If we come now to the most prominent scientific results, it's of course very difficult uh, to choose. On the other hand, um, I just tell you what we think is most important at the moment. Um, the calcolytic mass production of chameleon beads has been identified at the eastern part of Sapra, where millions of drills have been found. And Max Hypt um, and Christoph Pershwitz reconstructed the Chêne Paratoire uh, chameleon beads, which have been um, attested to in various sites in the Near East. The first set of um, uh, chemical analysis provided characteristic signatures for Tema, but this work is still in progress. This production dates as early as the 4,000 BC. Um, another uh, important aspect is the fact that uh, the so-called Iron Age oasis was, uh, had its largest existential in the early Bronze Age, 
and um, the first traces of a communal building. And shortly after the large wall system, day to a period after the last third of the fourth and the turn of the fourth to the third millennium BCE, um, in connection with the pottery sequence from the early Bronze Age uh, down to the earliest centuries of the uh, Common Era. Of course, um, the context of the Levant are tested through met metal, um, metal weapons, which were found in the uh, cemetery of Al Sanair in Al Nasim. I'm sorry, where uh, an undisturbed grave context was revealed, but with the two weapons, uh, which are characterized as status weapons, uh, were found together with a male individual and with uh, associated objects such as pottery and uh, beads. Um, the early Iron Age is one of the significant periods at Tema as far as this building is concerned, a public building outside of the real center where a number of Egyptianizing and um, Levantine objects have been found together with the very characteristic pottery, the Tema early Iron Age ware, characterized by geometric motifs and um, birds. And of course, the Tema as a multicultural, multilingual uh, oasis has to be mentioned. In Tema 2, which just appeared, um, the, uh, the, uh, all the inscriptions from the excavations have been collected by Michael McDonald, uh, most importantly, the cuneiform texts of King Nabonidus, as well as one of the many uh, inscriptions um, referring to the kingdom of Lefian, here explicitly mentioning a governor of behalf of the dynasty of Lefian at Tema, and uh, very interesting trilingual inscriptions in Imperial Aramaic, Aramaic of Taima and Nabataean, uh, referring to three deceased women on the funerary stele, which is a fantastic representation of a presentation scene. And of course, um, the architecture, and I refer to what I've been showing on the first slide, um, Imro al -Kais, um, the, palm, the, the rainstorm doesn't leave anything at Taima unless uh, it's built of stone. There's a huge architectural um, remains uh, excavated here, uh, most prominently a uh, temple building, which has been dated to the first millennium BCE, and as well as a extended residential quarter, uh, which has been dated from the mid first millennium down to um, late antiquity. A large building complex, which has not yet been explored, is a 18,000 square meter uh, complex of courtyards and large halls northwest to the central area, uh, which dates uh, to the first centuries of the first millennium AD. If you come now to the future orientation of the scientific project, we are basically, the future is now, so to say, we are currently excavating the second season of uh, funeral landscapes, contacts, mobility in Northwest Arabia during the Bronze Age. This is a systematic multidisciplinary research on Bronze Age grave art at the oasis of Tema. And in the core area, there's um, uh, 2,500 tombs in the northern part, and we have established a very uh, consistent uh, C14 chronology. And uh, we are currently at the half of the um, autumn season 2021. And we are, uh, you see here on the map, bottom left, uh, some of the many graves which have been identified in the area, which extends over an area of more than 40 square kilometers. And if uh, probably because we are now working in the field, I present our technological advances um, in recording our uh, context. Um, we are using a global navigation satellite system, which puts the so-called total station back in the shelf because we use uh, mobile phones and uh, MLITs, uh, mobile units, which are connected to a base station in order to record all the objects already in the site, um, as well as stratigraphic units, transporters, and all uh, data, and that is all then transferred into the GIS, um, which means that basically in the future, a database in the um, uh, old sense of the term uh, will probably not be used anymore. So uh, scientifically speaking, what is the future trends of the scientific project? Contextualizing Tema as an international uh, place, let's say, or as a hub with multi-connection, multi-connectivity, um, um, Alexander Stedler uh, is about to publish his study about the trade routes um, by applying least cost path analysis. 
based on the hypothesis that uh, satisfying movement strategy has been applied in order to move from one place to the other. And here you see some maps uh, he developed in order to reconstruct um, the trade network. Finally, and this is my last slide, um, and we have seen basically that this slide, which refers to the early phases of urbanization in the Near East and beyond, uh, published in 2019, doesn't show what we are all working on. And if you just look at the next slide, you see what the future trends of all our projects may be, because Northwest Arabia is now put on the map through early bronze context, and we know now that early bronze is only one part of a long story. And if we look at this map and see that how Northwest Arabia is now present, this is probably uh, another argument that the future, as I said, starts now. And I'm happy that we can participate in such a thriving research environment in order to contribute to study the history of the Arabian Peninsula. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Arno. Uh, thank you. The last speaker in this session is Dr. Sabal Faris. She is a professor of language and cultures of ancient uh, Arabia at Tolos University, Jean Jaurès. Uh, she got her PhD in linguistic from Aix Marseille University, a, a biographist uh, and archaeologist. She conducts research uh, on language and culture of ancient Arabs based on libidary text archaeology um, connected to social facts. She has been working at the site of Kilwa in Tabuk region. Dr. Sabah, Mark is yours. You get 15 minutes. Dr. Saba, do you hear me? Hello, excuse me. I launched my uh, PowerPoint before uh, opening my mic. Do you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so I will start now. Sorry. So here. Do you see my PowerPoint? Hello, do you see my PowerPoint? Yes, yes, it's okay. Okay, it's okay. okay, it's okay. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, thank you all for being here uh, in this uh, this uh, presentation, and many thanks for the organizers uh, for this event for allowing scientists working in Saudi Arabia to share their works and to do, to know better each others. Uh, thanks to all institutions that made this work possible, uh, to uh, Heritage Commission, uh, Ministry of uh, uh, Tourism previously, and uh, French Ministry for Foreign Affairs, CNRS, uh, ex Marseille University, and uh, many other institutions. Uh, we dedicate this presentation to our, uh, uh, to our uh, esteemed colleague, Professor Marc uh, Minchi, who left us too soon this summer. Uh, he is the author of one of the most important discoveries in Kilwa uh, in this project. So rest in peace, Mark. And his collaborators are with us now. And uh, like Bruno, he is here. Thank you, Bruno, for being here. And uh, we hope that we shall continue the work as he uh, always uh, he that did with us. Uh, this presentation, we shall go through overview of the project, technique, and scientific means used, uh, the most prominent scientific results and archaeological findings, and uh, at the end, the future uh, orientation of the project. Uh, Kilwa is uh, in, uh, it's located in North Saudi Arabia at 250 kilometers from, uh, from Tabuk, to the west, uh, northwest of Tabuk. To reach Kilwa, you have to take highway 150 kilometers and then 85 kilometers, something like this, to reach uh, Kilwa in a very hard uh, uh, landscape. Uh, Kilwa is uh, the main center of Kilwa. The project is, uh, sorry, 
The project is a, a 20 kilometer radius around main site of Kilwa here. It's in the, in the presentation in red one. And uh, the main site of Kilwa is, uh, it's uh, many, uh, uh, about 21 units for settlements, for daily settlements. There is four communal uh, units. Uh, there is two uh, hydraulic units and there is a waste unit that uh, that receives the trash, the trash of the site and uh, many, many uh, hydraulic installation and supplying system of the site. Uh, Kilwa, uh, Kilwa is, uh, is a HIMA protected area after a text uh, was uh, uh, published in the 50s. But it was never, uh, <coughs> never succeed to be read, and uh, we read it and publish it. And it's uh, in the text we read Bismillah, Hamad Ahl Taklamen, and the origin of the community is uh, broken. But we can see few letters, so it's a protected area already in that uh, in this area. The objective of the project is mapping uh, archaeological sites in uh, 20 kilometer radius. Uh, of the main site, mapping the hydraulic networks, diagnose, uh, diagnose uh, key sites through survey or extensive excavations. In, uh, in another uh, word, a Kilwa is a story of, uh, uh, is, is essentially the story of resilience and an ingenious strategy of natural resource management. Uh, to succeed in our to, to reach uh, our uh, our objectives, we rely in uh, in, in a multidisciplinary approach uh, to study uh, the site and the region in archaeology and epigraphy, architecture analysis, archaeobotanical studies, prehistory, geoarchaeological analysis, geomorphology, and biological anthropology. The timeline of the project is. Uh, uh, we start in 2008 by uh, realization of georeferenced geo aerial images. At that time, we don't have a drone. And then in 2009, we start the excavation on Kilwa main site, more georeferenced referenced aerial images, sediment analysis, archaeological mapping. Between 2010 and 2015, we continue the excavation on Kilwa main site, archaeological, and we continue the archaeological mapping. And in, uh, uh, and during this period, we also uh, we make diagnostics uh, or excavation in a tomb at the west of Kilwa main site, and uh, which bear uh, many uh, North Arabian and, uh, inscriptions. And uh, we make environment, environmental mapping and geophysical exploration and further environmental analysis. Uh, in uh, 2016, uh, we uh, we carry out special analysis, uh, spatial analysis, and remote sensing, bone analysis, and analysis of excavation of that. In between 2017 and 2019, we carry out. We were we were uh, the, uh, awarded by uh, funding uh, by the, uh, ex Marseille University and the Bexmed and the PACA region. And uh, it is two projects. It's one uh, of them. It was a, a Stormer project. This, uh, uh, this Stormer project includes Morocco. Uh, it was about uh, rain, uh, rainwater management in the Mediterranean basin. And it includes uh, Morocco, France, Spain, Italy, and Greece, uh, Jordan and Greece. Uh, the, it resulted of workshop organized in ex Marseille University in uh, 2020. The second project, Mirkap, it's also funded by La Bexmed, ex Marseille University, and uh, it was in line with the French government, according uh, to which science is a common good that we must share as widely as possible. The role of public authorities is to restore the initial function of science as a factor of collective enrichment. Mercapa project is uh, proposed the creation of collaborative and uh, 
collaborative and participatory uh, crowdsourcing platform dedicated to the observation, analysis, and modeling of linguistic, historical, and the climate data to better understand the consequence of aridity on population movement and the impact of this movement on human activity and organization. The most important prominent uh, discoveries, uh, scientific discoveries, of course, it was the recording of a great number of, of uh, epigraphical texts, uh, North Arabian mostly, and Islamic uh, uh, texts. Uh, many hundreds of prehistorical sites, uh, it was going from Paleolithic to Neolithic periods, uh, excavation and the study of core structures in site, uh, Kilwa main site. The study of, architect of the architecture of in Kilwa main site in the units, uh, that communal uh, units. And uh, Arcobotany, Linda, you are here. Can you comment my, uh, you want to comment my, the, 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 yes. The, the slide? Okay. So, Linda, I will go with. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so, good morning, everybody. So, to summarize um, the very interesting archaeobotanical research on the subsistence strategy in Kirwa, uh, the archaeobotanical study concerned seed, fruit, and charcoal analysis. The seed and fruit remains are represented by a large number of taxa, like cereals, pulses, and many fruits, such as uh, olive, date, grape, and pomegranate. As you can see on the on the photos uh, of remains of archaeological remains, uh, the interesting result uh, also is a great percentage of olive charcoals, who could indicate with the discovery of the uh, olive pits the presence of olive groves on the site. This kind of research engaged in Kiwa allowed to show uh, an, an original system of runoff agriculture based on the exploitation of the depressions, the CA, which concentrate water and uh, silt suitable for agriculture. Archaeobotanical, but also geographic, uh, geoarchaeologic, archaeological and ethnographic studies have provided so many clues that suggest that such agricultural practices may have taken place locally, despite the aridity of the region. The, the economy of this uh, community certainly had to be based on local cultures on the one hand, uh, but it's difficult to know which plants were cultivated uh, locally, and on the other hand, on trade uh, to meet food needs. So thank you, Saba, it's you. Thank you. So the next, uh, we also, uh, we study the, uh, we, we carry out, uh, so here it's a title, it's not good. We carry out a geophysical survey. It's uh, Professor Mark Menchi who carry out this with the Dr. Pauline Le Maire. Uh, here, Kilwa main site, and Kilwa main site is uh, just built near uh, Egar, a temporary lake. And the idea it was if there is agriculture, is, as Linda uh, said, that, that means somewhere here where there is water. And as we, we find some blocks and here in this area, Mark, he carried out this use physical survey. And here we found uh, that there is a big, huge basin, 50 meters by 20 meters, and it's around uh, five uh, meter uh, deeps. Uh, we carry out archeological diagnostic to verify these results. And we found here the wall, as you see, and it, uh, it was very, very difficult because the sedimentation is very high but it, uh, it's, uh, it was very clear. Uh, the other work that we carry out, it's my colleague, Dr. Vincent Olive, he is here with us, with in the attendees. It's uh, the uh, remote sensing, uh, special, analysis, special analysis, prediction of the geomorphological map, study of catchment areas, remote sensing, and study of gas sediment. Uh, remote sensing reveal uh, thousands of archaeological uh, sites, as you see here, but this work is still in progress. We carry out several uh, soundings in the Gare, where we found the basin, uh, and which allow us to date the beginning of the lake, the use of the lake, and the abundance of this lake. 
and this date it's it's corresponding to the uh, to the archaeological uh, remains all this data that we have epigraphy archaeology archaeobotany and uh, geoarchaeology uh, indicate that the site the main site of Kilwa it was uh, it was uh, highly occupied during the 7th century and the abundant it's about 1400 uh, AD and uh, it's 7th century AD of course one of uh, and here we have we have so in the Kilwa region we have Paleolithic and Neolithic sites that we record and study and now it's under publishing pre-Islamic period we have archaeology and epigraphy and geoarchaeology data that indicate this date and for Islamic period also we have this uh, same of data one of the most remarkable uh, scientific also results in Kilwa it's the inscription uh, the modic inscription related to a tomb we found the bones of the different of the, the person and that the inscription is talking about the people how much they are sad for this man and the analysis of bones indicate that this uh, biopatid analysis indicate that the site of the inscription is in the fourth century AD this is very spectacular because it's maybe the first one of the first time that we have epigraphy in archaeological context and here in the left, you have, we have the inscription that we found in the tomb. For future orientation of the scientific of this project, that we, we, we would like to continue the, the investigation of the structure, uh, structures around Kilwa. One of them, it's a tomb, and there is the Mudic inscription. So we hope that there is some bones that we can date and we can have more data. We would like to continue mapping of archaeological and epigraphical remains. Yes, I finish. Okay. Yeah. Remote sensing and uh, geoarchaeological investigation. And lastly, the excavation in Kilwa main site. Thank you all for listening. And I hope that I was not so much long. Thank you, Dr. Saba. The, the next part of this session is uh, the discussion. I have received some questions regarding to this session. The first question for Dr. Marta. Do you have any suggestion regarding why the occupation in Korea has been stopped at the beginning of Islamic period? Dr. Marta? Yes. Um, no, I don't have any suggestion. I, I, I don't know. Uh, I must say that uh, we, for, for what concerns the excavation and the stratigraphy, uh, we have uh, exca excavated and investigated very little of these very late for us uh, in the history of Korea, very late layers. So uh, maybe we will find out, but we have not find found out this, uh, until now. Inshallah, thank you. The, uh, the second uh, question for Dr. Romello. This is the Ashurian ceramic that has been discovered uh, at Adumatu were made locally or imported from outside do you have any uh, archaeological evidence related to this yes we have comparisons and also first archaeometric analysis most of the pottery is locally made imitating uh, neo-syrian models only one fragment apparently came from abroad from the levant mm -hmm. so uh, actually the, the the comparisons so are based on shapes fabrics uh, uh, this is the local elite of Dumat al Jandal that was uh, imitating luxury wares of the Assyrian. Okay, thank you. The third question for Dr. Arnoff Is there any archaeological evidence that show in which time the settlement uh, changed from the seasonal settlement to permanent settlement? That's a very interesting question, and we are currently trying to figure out um, the most recent results from the current season indicates that there is a building of walls to whatever kind of construction they belong right at the period after uh, right on the sediments, the old uh, lake sediments, and we are currently trying to find out um, when that had happened to us, it seems quite um, not surprising, but it's a quite abrupt appearance of early Bronze Age features in terms of the huge building, the walls. So we assume that there is some development, but that is archaeological thinking, of course, 
um, before, but we are currently trying to find out with these soundings uh, near the Sebra to bring some light into the dark. So we expect it, but we don't have the evidence yet. Thank you. Okay, thank you. The fourth uh, question is for Dr. Sabal Faris. What are the oldest inscriptions that were discovered at Kilwa site and what were their subjects? Uh, the, the most ancient inscription that we found is Tamudic inscription, North Arabian inscriptions. And the date, of course, in uh, epigraphy and in Tamudic inscription, it's very difficult to date. But in Kilwa, we have this chance that we found the inscription, this uh, 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 inscription in the tomb. And the date is the fourth century. But generally, we don't, uh, Tamudic inscription, it's, we have very vague, you know, the, uh, dates. It's, uh, it goes from 11th century BC until we said until two, uh, second century A AD, but we know that it's, uh, it was used until the beginning of uh, Islam. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, I think no more questions so far. That's the second session will end here, and we will take a break and meet you, meet with you in the third session, inshallah, at 4 p.m. and Riyadh time. Doctor Abdullah. Shukran, Dr. Majid. Thank you, Majid, and uh, our colleagues. We will see you, inshallah, after uh, 50 minutes from now. Thank you. Thank you very much.
دكتور عبد الرحمن يا اهلا وسهلا ممكن ممكن ايش بس يا ابو لحظه دقيقه بس اول شيء هل انا طالع مزيون ولا لا تراك على اللايف الحين يا رجل شايفينك مزيون طيب. دائما <تصفيق> شفت انكفشت طيب انا احسن لك رابط الحين تسوي براكتس فيه اوكي يلا يلا
Dr. Abdullah. Dr. Abdullah. السلام عليكم دكتور عبد الله الصوت واضح دكتور خالد دكتور خالد تسمعني؟ ايه دكتور عبد الله معك ارفع صوتك صوتك ضعيف ترى طيب الصوت واضح الان او باقي لا؟ لا ضعيف ترى انا اجرب المايك في بطل
ثلاثة في البث طيب اوكي دقيقة خالد دكتور لا شيل شيل ال شيل السماعة واضح خلاص كذا عبد الله كذا مضبوط خلاص خليك كذا خليك كذا مع بداية الجلسة نشوف طيب نبدأ يا شباب يلا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته ومرحبا بكم في آخر جلسة لهذا اليوم والتي ستكون بعنوان آثار وثقافة الواحات القديمة ورئيس الجلسة الدكتور خالد الأسمري أستاذ ما قبل التاريخ في قسم الآثار في جامعة الملك سعود والدكتور خالد من حاصل على الدكتوراه من جامعة يورك البريطانية في آثار ما قبل التاريخ في شمال المملكة العربية السعودية بالإضافة إلى إجرائه عدد من الأبحاث والدراسات في آثار شمال غرب المملكة في فترة ما قبل التاريخ رأس عدد من البعثات المحلية والدولية في مجال التنقيب على الآثار في موقع فيد الأثري بمنطقة حائل وكذلك شارك في عدد من الأعمال الأثرية الأخرى في مناطق المملكة نرحب بالدكتور خالد وكذلك بالمشاركين في هذه الجلسة الدكتورة سولين وغيوم شارلو ليلى نعمي وكذلك الدكتور عبد الرحمن السحيباني دكتور خالد تفضل وأرجو التنبيه على الوقت بالإضافة إلى أن الأسئلة ستكون متاحة عبر منصة اليوتيوب شكرا شكرا دكتور عبد الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أرحب بجميع الحضور في هذا الملتقى للمكتشفات الأثرية في المملكة العربية السعودية As my pleasure to welcome all attendees to this session I take the ability to extend many thanks to the Ministry of Cultural and Heritage Commission for uh, holding this uh, forum that contributes uh, to, show, uh, to showing the archaeological discoveries in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. To save the time, uh, we will go to the first uh, presentation uh, by Dr. Uh, Soulin. Dr. Soulin uh, got a PhD uh, in History of Art uh, and Archaeology University of Paris. Uh, she is uh, a head of the French Archaeological Mission in Wadi Matar and Wadi Shami in Jezan region. Dr. Soulin, uh, I'd like to use with the 15 minutes, please. Okay, thank you. I'll share. Okay. Good afternoon to everyone and thank you for the uh, invitation to communicate in this uh, archaeological discovery forum. Um, many thanks to the Heritage Commission of the Ministry of Culture and to uh, Dr. Abdullah Zahrani and also to Muhammad Al Malki and uh, Abdulaziz Al Omari who have headed the various campaigns with me since 2019. So the summary is uh, similar to the previous presentations, uh, just to present our project um, this, uh, techniques, discoveries, and future orientation. Uh, in the archipelago of Farasan, located so in uh, Muhafaza Jizan, in the southwest uh, area of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So to start with an overview of the project, it encompasses the archaeological and hepigraphical heritage of the Farasan Islands, of which you can see a closer map here with the main sites 
with uh, intervened on, majorly localized in the eastern part of the main island, Farasan al Kubra. The Farasan Islands comprise many archaeological sites, ranging from prehistory to the Ottoman period and even later modern sites. Our project is devoted to the pre Islamic history of the islands from the ancient South Arabian period, that is 1200 to 800, 600 BC, to the advent of Islam, that is in antiquity and late antiquity until um, Islam arrives in the region. We aim to understand the occupation pattern, the subsistence strategies, um, and the culture of the populations through time. For example, the three main chronological um, eras that we're interested in is when Sabaeans uh, invested the Red Sea to navigate to the northern horn of Africa, when the Romans occupied the islands in the second century CE, and in late antiquity, when the population of the islands participated in the Aksumite retaliation campaign after the persecution of the Christian community in the southwestern Arabian Peninsula. The aim is to record the archaeological sites, to map the ancient occupation of the islands through time, and to protect the heritage from future dis destructions, as urban development and looting has already destroyed a great number of major sites. In the central image, you can see the area we um, surveyed in uh, 2020. Uh, the yellow dots are the sites, and the uh, hatched area is the area destroyed by uh, the development of the modern city of uh, Farasan, and that is 40% of the surveyed area, so um, an enormous uh, amount of destruction. Oh, sorry. Southern Farasan for the survey is almost complete, and the preliminary dating is possible by pottery observations, but remain mostly hypothetical in the absence of pottery typology to this day. In this area, most sites are dated to Bronze Age, Late Bronze Age, and South Arabian phases from 1500 to uh, 600 BC, and extended dating. An explanation is that access to the sea in this southern coast was lost after the silting of the southern coast of the Wadi Matar, that is the area we're studying. So this Wadi Matar area, the Wadi Matar 2 site we're working on, is located in a plain comprising several sites exhibiting dry stone architecture and material ranging from the ancient South Arabian period down to late antiquity. The most visible remains are ascribable to the Hemiri Roman period in the 2nd century CE, when the temple in Wadi Matar II, in the central image, was rebuilt. Excavation have started with small soundings in 2013, and the project grew bigger since uh, 2019 with the first uh, larger uh, excavation campaign in the area. The site is vast and offers uh, interesting fields of study for local South Arabian population. Findings of South Arabian pottery, inscriptions and coins confirmed the local, uh, the regional nature, let's say, of the site population at the same time of the Roman occupation. The team worked on three main areas within the modern SCTH fence, a former SCTH, a sanctuary, so the temples in the middle of the, in the middle image, a domestic area with uh, some of uh, monumental features, um, which is on the right, and a possible workshop area, not represented here, comprising 10 small built units, each bearing specific material on the surface, like pottery for one, metal slags for the other one, murex shells in quantities, um, and C14 uh, datings have shown that the area was, the, the whole site was uh, populated as early as the 15th century BC down to the 6th century CE. The second area where we have um, worked on is the Wadi Shami in the northeastern part of the main island, and the team has surveyed the area and recorded sites from the first millennium BC to very modern sites, and the area is not populated anymore, but is used for seasonal farming. Uh, two sites have been chosen for further study so far. Wadi Shami 5 is a group of three funerary areas. The largest one con containing comprises Christian tombs. And the, the cleaning of a tomb in 2014, the one you can see on the lower left of the screen, after it was plundered, allowed to observe the inside masonry. 
Next to this site, Wadi Shami 10, is a domestic area. And the upper levels from the soundings we performed in 2020 um, allow to, to date it to the eight to the between the 8th and the 11th century CE. A coin and a pottery shows parallels with other site north of Zizan and Zabid in the Yemeni Tihama. We aim to verify if this site has lower levels that can be dated to the late antiquity, like the, between the 4th and the 6th century, when uh, we su suppose that the Christian community was uh, established in this area. For the techniques we used, um, it's um, the, the the project, like the team records the data from the survey in a GIS, Geographical Information System, and the excavation results in a separate database for the moment. A model of the database record is used to produce a notebook on the field to take notes during a workday, and we use English, French, and Arabic depending on the language the excavator is more comfortable with. The GIS offers various analysis. Gurgen Daftian of the CNRS, CEPAM, has produced different maps with a digitation, digital elevation model, visibility studies to analyze the occupation of the territory and the environment based on the archaeological remains, the satellite images and the geomorphological studies. Photogrammetry has been used by Gurgen Daftian and Vincent Miai to record the structures prior to excavation. They consist, constitute a digital backup of the remains at a precise scale. And the means used have been aerial photographs by guides with a cane and um, uh, up, with a cane, sorry, <laughs> uh, which allow to, 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 to have a better definition. So on the right is a 3D model that we have um, uh, produced for the, uh, for the temple in Wadi Matar to see. And on the left, the top plan of the site of Rorain, located in the uh, center east of the main island. Uh, so that's a preparation for future work. The project uh, is uh, using what is considered common standard archaeological um, practices. So that is something that most of you will be familiar with. And the project includes a geomorphological study of the environment of the archipelago to better understand um, the, and to reconstruct the former landscape and the pattern of settlements and their evolution through time. In an insular context, the evolution of the relative sea level must be examined. The study also works on mapping the assets offered by archaeological areas, topography, water, arable lands and biodiversity to understand the choices operated by the past population, especially in the Roman period for our current program. In Falasan, the fresh water can be found in many areas and uh, logically in the archeological site. Wells have been dug in the rock and sometimes taking advantage of natural cracks in the bedrock. In 2014 and 2019, the project wanted to, the team wanted to determine whether the southern coast of Wadimata could have been harbor. And um, the map that we produced shows possible uh, former bays protected by a dune. Um, and the, the borehole that we performed there uh, indicated that this was indeed a marine environment, but that got silted up by the end of the first millennium BC, therefore excluding the place as a Roman harbor, but possibly an older one, given the concentration of um, sites from earlier periods. The analysis of the pottery collected in the surveys is ongoing. The study consists of observation, classification according to the fabric. Uh, that datation can be provided by association, by the dated stratigraphic unit or well-dated pottery. And thermoluminescence in the future would help in the absolute dating of the assemblage. A preliminary study was done in Wadi Matar area and it shows uh, Mediterranean um, wares from antiquity, like in Fora, Terra Sigileta, and some, some Nabataean shirts. And, uh, and local assemblages are more difficult to recognize in the lack of comparative studies. So that is one goal of the mission, to produce um, local typology, top, typologies of local wares so that it can be identified in Farasan and also around the Southern Red Sea to, to identify them in other assemblages from other sites. So archaeometry will be essential in determining which are local and which are imported. 
As for the results that we have obtained so far, um, excavation and surveys in the Wadi Mata broad area have shown an occupation in the late Bronze Age and ancient South Arabian periods. Ancient South Arabic uh, inscriptions in the pottery hint at the early South Arabian phase, although no archaeological levels have yet been identified. A Sabaic inscription written in Bustrophedon in uh, the, the the one, not the last one, the one before on the screen, is a dedicatory text to the deity Astar, which could imply that the area was already a cultic place in the ancient South Arabian period. The pottery found was also similar to that of Sihi and Sabr, so that Bronze Age and Late Bronze Age. And uh, our excavation has shown that under the temple, there are some uh, 1500 uh, BC dated levels. So the question is whether it was already a cultic place then, which would be interesting, but the conservation is unfortunately very bad to determine a function at, the, at this time. The excavation and surveys in Wadi Matar 2, C and B have yielded pottery ascribable to the first and second century, and this date corresponds to the Roman presence in the Farasan archipelago. So the C14 dating and material confirm this dating. Um, the material recovered comprises Roman material as well as as well as Himyari and South Arabian ones, like like uh, calcite uh, figurines, bronze, uh, uh, copper alloy. Um, uh, fig, foot figurine and bronze of um, copper alloy bell, as well as silver coins. All the surveys carried out since the beginning of the project are starting to reveal uh, their organization of the territory in the Roman period during the Roman uh, uh, occupation attested by the Latin inscription. So with the help of the GIS and skills of the team, uh, visibility, visibility studies have allowed to map this organized occupation of the insular territory. And given the distri distribution of the archaeological sites, we can now hypothesize that the Romans had control over a large part of the eastern uh, part of the island and possibly more. So the uh, oasis of al and is linked to a tower that overlooks a bay and that is a um, perspective for future work. The results have helped define future orientation for our project, and the options are numerous because of uh, uh, the, the, the sites in uh, Falasan are so rich. So here are the perspectives for research in the short and long term that we have chosen to develop. Uh, we will continue in the Wadi Matar area as the chronological um, needs to be chronological um, uh, of a chronology of occupation, sorry, needs to be clarified and the poetry as well. In the broad area, the datation uh, will be more precise because of the progress in the pottery and maybe excavation of properly conserved uh, um, levels. The stratigraphy has proven very disappointing uh, and the bedrock lies very, very uh, shallow and close to the surface. Starting this season, which is ending in a few days, we are currently working there, the project broadened to uh, its scope of research by including al Qusar because it's thought to be one place of garrison of the Roman soldiers. And the current field season is um, proven very, very productive and very interesting as we have indeed uh, the levels uh, well, well, con pr well preserved of the Roman occupation in al Qusar. So the, it's very ex exciting and the objectives have been attained for this and offer very, very exciting perspectives. So yeah, in the future, we will continue with pottery typology and specialist studies for the, the excavation performed so far. And in the long-term future, because of uh, financial constraints, uh, the project aims to expand the, its activities with the submerged remains uh, and the survey of the coast is necessary to look for harbor infrastructures and possible shipwrecks. So yes, that is our perspective for now. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Solin, for your presentation. We are now uh, moving to the second uh, presentation by Dr. Uh, Dr. Guillaume Gott, a PhD uh, in Eastern Archaeology from Paris, Sorbonne University. He is currently a researcher at uh, the French 
National Center for Scientific Research. He is uh, the head of two archaeological mission, uh, Al Badr and the Camel site in uh, Al Jouf uh, region. Uh, Dr. Uh, Guillaume, please. Thank you very much. Um, so, you can hear me? And... Yes, it's clear. Yeah. Um, so, Median is of importance for the faithful of the three religions of the book. The entity of Median, people of our land, is indeed mentioned nearly 60 times in the Bible, uh, with, while references to it are found 10 times in the Quran. Two of the most significant episodes of the uh, Old Testament are the reception of Moses by the prophet Jethro in Median after his flight from Egypt, and later the offering of a sacrifice to God on Mount Sinai near Median during Exodus. In the Quran, the people of Median are accused of idolatry and dishonest business practices by, by Shuaib, a prophet sent by God. The people subsequently die as a result of God's wrath and a divine earthquake. Because of these mentions in, of Median in the Quran and the Bible, the location of the, this place has sparked intense debate since the 19th century. While some scholars consider placing it in Sinai in the past, there is a growing scientific consensus that Median is in North Asia. And today, if the light Bronze Age entity Median seems impossible to localize precisely, although we might suppose that it was situated in northwestern uh, Arabia, possibly in Korea, a careful reading of Arabic, Arab Islamic sources leaves little doubt as to the location of Islamic Median is al Bada. It is confirmed by the 9th century Arab scholar al Yaqubi, who specified that Median is located on the pilgrimage road between Egypt and Mecca, more precisely between the stations of Sharaf al Baal, south of Ayla and Akal, and Ainuna on the Red Sea, south of al Bada. As you can guess, the supposed uh, identification with Madian is one of the major goals for studying uh, al Bada. But this is not the only one. In particular, the Nabatean settlements and the rock cut tombs that some of you know, or the long term occupation of the oasis from the prehistoric period to the modern times. The oasis of al Bada is situated east of the Gulf of Aqaba in a seismic region at the outlet out of a transverse valley of the Wadi Afal at the apex of a vast plain known as the Lisan Basin. The Oasis of El Bada occupies an area about seven kilometers long with variable width estimated minimally between 500 meters to two kilometers from north to south. Its elongated shape is attributed to its location. So in the, of this, uh, because it is located in this Wadi Afal. And early in the 1980s, Saudi authorities were already aware of the significance of the, of the area and provided protection for the archaeological sites here in uh, yellow by erecting a ser series of metal, metal fences uh, that you can see here. The late 20th century city of Al Bada, therefore, mainly developed north of these major historical areas, in particular to the west, where you have Al Malha, Moir Shraib, and Al Asifir. And to the east of Wadi Afal, another wide district named Al Disa extended farther south of Jebel Safra, away from the major archaeological zones named Al Kala, Rudeida, Al Burj, Malgata, and Al Adafa. The oasis was visited and mentioned several times by Arab geographers during the medieval period and by Western uh, travelers following Rupert's visit in 1829, in particular Burton, Musil, Philby, before past teams and the study comprehensive survey. However, the mapping remained very imprecise and the oasis globally unknown. Although the site is today mainly famous in Saudi Arabia for its rock cut tombs and its well, the Bia Saidni, many other archaeological sites remains and remains have been recorded recently and of more great historical interest and historical value. As it was shown, by our project recently, directed by Sama Salah and myself, assisted by Walid al Badawi since 2017. We have carried out five field campaigns for the moment, mostly survey and excavations, and this is the reason why our results are still very preliminary. 
In order to correctly map the archaeological sites in the Oasis, we have developed a multidisciplinary strategy based on the acquisition of high-resolution aerial imagery and on field survey of all archaeological remains integrated into GIS linked with databases. Our strategy in El Bada combined geomorphological and hydrological studies. We have recorded wells and all types of related structures. Trying to understand the evolution of the water management in the past decades, we have also identified a network of, network of canals, which are underground drainage galleries, as you can see on the image to the top right of the slide. So canals were used in many Saudi oases in the past, but not in all of them. We have also conducted Geophysical survey in all major areas, thanks to the team from the University of Strasbourg, permitting, for instance, to identify the organizations of walls and houses via ground penetrating radar. We have also discovered the necropolis in Rodegda area this occasion. And so on the right image, the yellow dots are each of them one tongue, which are not visible on the surface. Let me also mention the rediscovery of a citadel in El Cala to the, top, to the bottom left. Very, which is very impressive uh, walls and structures. During our field survey and through a remote sensing, we have also recorded hundreds of unknown tombs and produced 3D modeling of the facades of the rock cut tombs. In order to build a global picture of the oasis through time, the team has also tried to carry out test excavations in all sites previously mentioned. Here we can see a test excavation open in a possible Roman fort. And you see here the, the, the walls in, in white, gypsum, this is, which appears on the image. And you see, you're going to see the, the towers here for another one there. And you see the, uh, the size of this structure, which is extremely impressive. Extensive excavations and in-depth soundings permitted to reach the oldest levels of the sites, in particular in El Malha, while architectural study concentrated on the modern mud brick, stone, and cement village of El Malha, which is for, the, for this one from the, 11th, from the 20th century, so it's a modern one. In order to get um, a very global understanding of the site and its evolution through time, we decided to focus on all periods and all aspects of daily life in the oasis. This preliminary rock work permitted to reveal already a great amount of complete vessels and the artifacts, among many other impressive results. The history of the Bada region did not begin with the medium median period, but dates back to a much more distant past in the Paleolithic period. Its first traces cannot be found still scattered throughout the region. The obvious indications of permanent, some in permanent occupation within the confines of the oasis date back to the late Neolithic, the first half of the seventh millennium BC. Time a small community and settled on a high terrace of conglomerates at the Atsifia site. A sounding revealed extremely rich assemblage, including Lithics, faunal, and botanical remains. Although no architectural remains have been identified for the moment, the finds indicate that a fully developed agropastoral society resided in the, at the oasis nearly 9,000 years ago. Following this first installation, few shirts and one for a radiocarbon dating uh, from a hearth to, seems to suggest an installation from the end of the fourth millennium BC on the site of Rudeida on the other side of Wadi Afra. Stone dwellings consist of small domestic structures, and the collected artifacts are, however, still very sparse and must remain, and we must remain, uh, remain rather cautious. Recent archaeological investigation now emphasize a high density of occupations during the first millennium BC and with a small presence in the late second millennium BC, and the occupation at these times appears to be concentrated on this Rudeida site, but it, it is much uh, more extended and very extensive there, uh, almost on 1.6 kilometers long, albeit discontinuous and heterogeneous. Median appears as a toponym for a city among classical authors. Ptolemy distinguished two Median, both located in northwest of Arabia Felix. Modiana is a port in the coast of the Red Sea, south of Madiama, which is located inland, as confirmed by Eusebius of Caesarea and St. Jerome, who placed Median in the Saracen deserts east of the Red Sea. 
Along with Egra and Dumat, Al-Bada is considered to have been one of the main Nabatian sites in northwestern Arabia. The area of Moria Shoaib, which can say, contains more uh, ostentious tombs, is the most well documented uh, by previous travelers and explorers. Field data, poetry, coins, inscriptions collected during previous surveys confirm a dense occupation in the first half of the first millennium AD. The main um, city developed in the central area of El Malha on colluvial and conglomerate terraces located on the west bank of the Wadi. We suppose a current urban area of approximately 26 hectares. The sandex that reach the bedrock appear to show the beginnings of the occupation of this sector in the second half of the first century BC and a dense occupation installation in the Roman to Byzantine period. And on the tail too, you can see just in front of you, the excavations revealed an almost square building featuring 17 rooms in its upper phase, three phases from the Nabatean to the Byzantine periods were identified. The deepest phase was only excavated in a few rooms in the northwestern part of the building, and it yielded a private bathroom dating to the Nabatean period. The hydraulic architecture is composed of small contiguous basins separated by a corridor, all of which are coated with white hydraulic plaster near a heating zone. A nice bronze lamp with acanthus leaves and two dolphin was uncovered in a basin. This suggests that the building was probably devoted to the private accommodation of elite individuals not far possibly from their monumental tombs. Other discoveries from this period include the 4th century inscription, a fragmentary bronze sheet with a few Latin letters which is part of a military uh, diploma dated 142 AD, but also untouched tombs. These are the most spectacular recent finds, but there are many others in particular concerning the Islamic period. I won't detail. Compared to the other uh, oasis of Northwestern Arabia, Al-Bada presents a rather exceptional sequence of development, one that covers periods and types of settlements almost little known in the region today. If we, are, if we try to summarize this on the map of the oasis, it shows a very long human occupation of the area and many changes in the location of the settlement through time from the Neolithic period to the modern times, number 10. From one to 10. Our initial uh, understanding of the oasis requires, of course, uh, further refinements and confirmations, which can only be achieved by additional fieldwork. We must not forget that cities we have only uh, carried out three uh, expedition, three uh, campaigns for only excavations. The exact chronology, the extent of each archaeological site, and the changes of the landscape remain to be confirmed. We need to study several sites, the Roman fort, to uncover large public buildings, uh, which are known by uh, through um, um, stones and uh, decorated stones, and to excavate of the tombs. And study are so many other sites, uh, for instance, Rudeida, and we have to focus on it, and Alborj areas to the uh, left, top left. In addition to support from the Heritage Commission of the Ministry of Culture, the project also benefits from the support of the King Saud University and many French institutions, in particular the French National Center for Scientific Research. I have also, um, I have already, uh, thanks this morning, uh, the Heritage Commission and all his staff for, 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 for his work. I, I want to focus now for, um, to, to say that we are very much indebted to all Saudi and French members of the team. I could not mention all of them, but uh, I think uh, in particular to Walid al Badawi and to, um, to uh, uh, Abdulillah al Taimani and to many others. And I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Diaz, for your presentation. Now we move, move the, to the third presentation uh, by Dr. Leila Naima. Dr. Leila uh, Naima, Senior Research Fellow, uh, Professor uh, at the French National Center uh, for Scientific Research, uh, a specialist in the archaeology and the bibliography of the ancient Near East, uh, is known for her uh, research on Nabatean writings, uh, the evolution of Nabatean script into the Arabic and uh, archaeological excavation at Patra and uh, Madain uh, Saleh. Professor uh, Leila? Yes, I'm here. Everybody hears me, I hope. 
so good evening to all of you and uh, I'm talking uh, to you from uh, Hegra where we arrived uh, three days ago and so that explains the nice background behind me because we're staying in a very nice farm uh, north of the site proper. So I will be uh, talking to you about um, Hegra and I guess that uh, my friends in Riyadh will uh, pass the slides so I will just say next please. So it would have to be the second slide from now, if possible. Yes. Can anybody hear me? Yes. Uh, yes. As, as yeah. Yeah. So you put the second slide because I can, I don't see it. Uh, okay. So um, I, I will I will be talking about uh, yes the next slide please. The I will be talking about Hegra. Hegra, as you all know, lies in the northwest part of Saudi Arabia, and it is one we could one could say the southern capital of the Nabatean Kingdom. It was it was located on the southern margins of the Nabatean Kingdom, and therefore also uh, most probably on the southern border of the Roman Empire, since as you know the Nabatean Kingdom was annexed as a whole in AD 106 by Emperor Trajan. So today, I will not talk to you about uh, everything we have uncovered on the, science, on the site since we started the excavations uh, almost 20 years ago, because we started in 2002. That would take too much time. But I have chosen, next slide please, I have chosen to talk about a particular aspect of one particular monument of the so-called residential area, which is corresponds to the ancient ancient city, of course, and which lies in the middle of the uh, site, which is a very large site. So this uh, ancient city, next one, please. Next slide, yes, is um, surrounded by a, a rampart, which is about three kilometer long. And this rampart was uh, mainly built of uh, mud brick and was um, flanked by 30, about uh, 38 towers, which uh, were part of the defensive system. So the, the monument I will be talking about uh, today is the uh, area of the so-called Roman fort, which is area 34, which lies on the southern uh, part of the city. And it is exactly adjacent to the southern perimeter of the rampart of the city on the it's, its inside. So this Roman fort, next slide, please. This Roman fort was uh, identified by François Villeneuve and ex excavation uh, was, um, was started in 2015 by uh, my colleague, Dr. Zbigniew Fiema uh, from uh, Helsinki. So he has been excavating it uh, since 2015. And so it's a building which is about 80 by 75 meters and um, its uh, exterior wall is um, has rectangular rectangular towers all along it and it also has two corner towers as well as towers flanking the gate and um, it was built uh, probably in about AD 120 130 and actually the dimensions of the rooms which have been identified inside attest to the use of the Roman foot, which shows that the fort was actually indeed uh, built by the Roman army and not by anyone else. So this would, this is, and it will still be, even if there is one in El Bada now, the uh, southernmost Roman fort in the Arabian Peninsula and possibly still um, the most ancient one after uh, the one uh, which is for the moment its closest parallel, which is Hamayma in southern Jordan. So there has been a lot, quite a lot of finds since uh, we started the excavations, among which this nice altar on the left, which is dated to the reign of the um, of Emperor Caracalla uh, between 2013 and 2017, or this nice uh, bronze figurine of a goat, which was part of votive offerings left when the legionaries left uh, the fort. So um, a couple of years ago, the gate of the fort, next slide please, was identified, 
yes, no, there's one before that. Oh, this is not the latest version. So, okay, uh, you don't have the latest version. Never mind. Uh, the the gate of uh, the fort was identified, and um, when one thinks of uh, gates uh, in Roman forts, one also thinks of um, the garbage and of the place where the Romans would have thrown their garbage, of course, outside the camp, which, as we know, because as we know, the Romans were very keen on hygiene in, in general. So uh, since the excavation started there and since the gate was identified on the southern part of the wall, I kept in mind this uh, question of where the uh, was there and is there and where is uh, the Roman dump. And um, next slide, please. This was uh, it's a pity. Uh, there's no the latest version because uh, never mind. It still works. Um, being if by comparison with uh, the forts of the Oriental Desert in Egypt, um, it's, there are about five of either the forts or the Roman quarries, like the Porphyrites, uh, which have yielded. Uh, Roman dumps. And so on the left, you will see uh, the uh, dump of Crocodilo. And uh, on the, the bottom left part of the slide, you see the uh, very complex um, stratigraphy of the fort of Maximianon. And so both Crocodilo and Maximianon were on the road between Neos Armos and Coptos. Uh, so uh, considering that these forts had uh, dumps, we asked ourselves uh, whether we could possibly find these, um, the same dump in uh, the Roman fort of Hegra. Next slide, please. And by uh, discussing with our uh, friend um, uh, Marc de Cousseau, he's a microbial um, a specialist of microbial ecology who works in the CIRAD, which is the Center for uh, agronomical um, research center for sorry agriculture research center for international development it's exactly the other way around uh, in french um, we thought that it might be uh, useful and uh, possible to find the location of the dump through the chemical analysis and the chemical imprint of uh, the fort uh, of the um, of various samples outside the fort. So we installed stakes uh, during the last season at about between two and a half meter and five centimeters apart and um, about 150 samples of earth were taken and analyzed and the results were obtained. And um, I will now leave the, 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 the room to Mark. But before that, I will just say that since you will see that there's something nice which came out from this analysis and this possible nice thing, we will now um, start to find it on the field and someone is coming possibly to find the dump after what's been done. So I will now uh, leave, Mark, leave Mark to talk about both the technology applied and the results which he obtained. À toi, Mark. Okay, thank you, Leila. I think uh, everybody uh, can uh, hear me. Sound is good? That's a, that's a clear. Okay. That's clear. Sound is clear. So thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, as uh, Leila told uh, all, all of you, the challenge was to locate the site of a few square meters without doing classical archaeological excavation. For this, we use the ability of plant. So, uh, next slide, please. We we use the ability. Uh, next slide, please. We use the ability of plant to bring deeply buried chemical element to the surface. So, this ability has already been demonstrated. Uh, for example, in Australia, to locate gold deposit, as reported is uh, in this article published in Nature in uh, 2013. The change in soil chemistry will also uh, impact the microbial community of the sediment, as it has already been observed 
on a Gallo-Roman site in France, where the ectomycorrhizal community of oak is specific in archaeological sites compared to undisturbed forest sites. Thus, we have chosen to characterize the chemistry of and microbiology <clears throat> of surface sediment only between 20 and 40 centimeters deep at most, while being the less intrusive possible. Uh, next slide, please. For, for this, we choose, um, uh, for, for, for this soil chemistry, we choose to use X-ray fluorescence technology, which allows in a few seconds to identify and quantify in the soil, the element of the periodic table from magnesium to uranium, typically more than 40 elements in our sample because some are absent, so you have no results. And, uh, but this is a very uh, cheap and uh, convenient uh, method for analysis, uh, all uh, elements. Uh, for the characterization of microbial population, we use new generation sequencing technologies of the uh, soil microbial DNA uh, using the Illumina MySec technique. For this characterization, uh, chemical and microbial, it is necessary to create a local reference frame. So, next slide, please. We carried out, as you see on this uh, on this uh, map, two uh, transects, one uh, south outside and uh, a second north inside the, the, the rampart. And uh, uh, it's uh, this uh, transect are necessary to get to create a local reference uh, of what is the natural chemistry of uh, soil in uh, near near the port and what is the normal uh, microbiology uh, of course of this uh, of this soil so uh, for this characterization, as we need to create a reference, we take on each transect, we perform 26 control samples. We take 26 samples uh, in the south, from the south transect on the line, and uh, the same on the north. The only difference is we, the line in the south is 20, 260 meters, and in the north, 130, but... Uh, never mind the, the distance between the sampling points. And we also take 26 samples inside the fort. What, why inside the fort? Because inside the fort, we know that we will have uh, a lot of uh, positive control and strong variation in the chemistry of these sediments compared to ne negative control. Outside the fort, south of the south wall, we focus our, our sampling effort by taking three sets of 26 samples. So sample consists of 50 millimeter aliquot of sediment for X-ray analysis and 15 millimeter aliquot of sediment for microbial analysis. So next slide. And next, yes, thank you. So the first result that we present to you is in a form of a principal component analysis that show that the sediment chemistry are impacted by past human activities. Thus, we observe two distinct group of points. A first group for soil that I will qualify as natural and a group for soil that we can consider as uh, archaeological and with uh, at least with human impact. The distinction uh, between these two groups of soil is supported mainly by four groups of elements. The first uh, group is, in fact, the ratio between aluminium and silicon. Indeed, the soil is very sandy. It's not surprising in uh, Saudi Arabia. And, but the house use clay for the wall, for construction. So de facto, the addition of clay increases the amount of aluminium and 
therefore reduce the proportion of, si of silica. So it changed and it is clearly visible when you are in a house that aluminum is growing up and silica down. The second group of elements include calcium, strontium, and phosphorus, which are most likely food leftovers. And uh, as you know, bones con uh, contain a lot of calcium and some strontium, teeth also, and also phosphorus. Dr. Mai, yes? Can you include it in one minute, please? Yes, I, I will do my best. So uh, next, next slide, please. So, what you can see on this uh, uh, map is that we found uh, uh, an anormally, uh, anormal uh, concentration of phosphorus uh, just out of the south uh, 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 gate of the Roman fort. And we suspect it is the uh, dump area that we were looking for. So, next slide, please. So we look for other elements, and as you see inside the fort, we have strong activities, and also near the wall. And thank. Uh, and uh, next slide, please. So next, next. I think I think yes. This is a version with many elements. So uh, this is indium. Indium is important, but if uh, for question. So thank. You. Next slide, please. Next, next. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, further, uh, so first we need to uh, be sure that what we uh, spot as the dump area is the dump area, but that this is for the next campaign for the excavation. So next, please. Next, I'll go direct to the microbiology. So to conclude in uh, maybe more than one minute, sorry. To conclude, we have, since last week, the first result of microbial population from archaeological sediment. We have confirmation that past human activities present at archaeological sites still impact microorganisms at this site, and that modern sequencing tools allow the identification of taxa specific to archaeological sites. So, that uh, this uh, combination of chemistry and uh, microbiology is a very, very uh, modern tool to, uh, uh, to precise where to look at some activities and to precise activities. And for example, uh, we have good uh, indicator of, uh, of uh, metallurgical activities in, uh, in the site. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mark and uh, Leila, for your presentation. Now we move to the last and not last page in this meeting. It is the meeting with Dr. Sahibani. دكتور عبد الرحمن السحباني استاذ الاثار المشارك بجامعه الملك سعود والقائم باعمال المدير التنفيذي للمقتنيات ومستشار الاثار والهيئه الملكيه لمحافظه العلا دكتور عبد الرحمن تفضل شكرا دكتور خالد شكرا حقيقه لهيئه التراث على ترتيب هذا اللقاء العلمي الذي سيكون له بلا شك فائده متميزه من خلال تبادل المعلومات بين جميع الفرق العلميه العامله في المملكة أستاذنك دكتور خالد سيكون العرض الشرائح باللغة الإنجليزية وسأتحدث باللغة العربية محاولة للوصول إلى طلابنا وزملائنا الذين لا يتحدثون اللغة العربية تفضل دكتور باسم واضح العرض دكتور خالد أي واضح تفضل دكتور باسم مشروع دادان الاثري ونيابه عن زملائي جميعا اتشرف اليوم بتقديم عرض ملخص لنتائج الموسم الميداني الاول لمشروع دادان الاثري والذي تم في فبراير مارش من العام 2020 وهو مشروع ترعاه الهيئه الملكيه لمحافظه العلا بالشراكه مع الوكاله الفرنسيه لتطوير العلا والمركز الوطني الفرنسي للابحاث العلميه وجامعه الملك سعود. 
ويشرف على المشروع كل من كل من الدكتور جيروم رومير من المركز الوطني الفرنسي وعبد الرحمن السحباني من الهيئه الملكيه لمحافظه العلا وجامعه الملك سعود. كما يعلم الجميع فللاسف كان موسما قصيرا جدا حيث توقف بعد قرابه ثلاثه اسابيع فقط من البدء بسبب جائحه كورونا ومع ذلك كما سنرى فان النتائج التي تم الحصول عليها خلال هذه الفتره الزمنيه القصيره تعتبر واعده للغايه. لن اتوسع كثيرا في الحديث عن الموقع الجغرافي للموقع حيث اعتقد انه معلوم لدى الجميع ولكن بشكل سريع جدا فهو احد المواقع الاثريه التي تقع في شمال محافظه العلا على مبعد قرابه 18 كيلو مترا جنوب موقع الحجر وهو كما هو معلوم احد اهم المواقع التي تقع على طريق البخور خلال فتره الالف الاول قبل الميلاد. ساكون اكثر تحديدا قليلا حول الاجزاء الرئيسيه للموقع حيث ان الموقع الاثري المعروف اليوم باسم دادان يضم في الواقع عدة مكونات مميزة قلب الموقع وهو وهي عبارة عن مجموعة من الخطط على شكل بيضاوي تمتد على مساحة 600 متر من الشمال إلى الجنوب وقرابة 250 متر من الشرق إلى الجنوب هذه هي تقريبا الأطلال التي تعود لفترة الألف الأول قبل الميلاد والتي غالبا ما تتبادر إلى أذهان الناس عندما يذكر اسم موقع دادان إلى الشرق من هذه الأطلال وعلى حافة الجبل الشرقي المحاذي لموقع دادان توجد المحاجر القديمة والمقابر والتي يصل عددها إلى المئات يقع الجزء الثالث من الموقع في أقصى الجنوب وتتكون من عدة تلال متناثرة نسميها مجازا المستوطنة الجنوبية إذا حكمنا من خلال اللقة السطحية يمكن أن تكون هذه المستوطنة الجنوبية متأخرة بشكل كبير عن أطلال المنطقة الرئيسة حيث تم الكشف عن فخار يعود إلى فترة القرن السادس الميلادي ولكن هذا سابق لأوانه ونحتاج للمزيد من التنقيبات في هذه المنطقة حتى نستطيع الفهم أكثر أخيرا يقع الجزء الرابع في شمال الموقع وهو يتألف من مبنى ضخم يعتبر حصنا ومستوطنة صغيرة كلاهما من الفترة الإسلامية المبكرة كما ترون على الخريطة تشمل منطقة مشروع دادان الأثري هذه المواقع الأربعة بالإضافة إلى مسح, إلى مسح قمة الجبل المحاذي لموقع دادان من الشرق ضمن هذه المساحة الكبيرة من العمل يحتوي المشروع على أربعة أهداف رئيسية الأولان علمياً وهما إجراء حفريات واسعة النطاق في الموقع ومحاولة التنقيب كذلك في مناطق جديدة لتكوين صورة أوضح عن الموقع وعن مملكتي دادان ونحيان وثانياً إجراء مسح منهجي للجبل المحاذي للموقع من جهة الشرق الهدف الثالث له علاقة أكبر بالتعليم ونقل المعرفة أحد مستهدفات البرنامج حيث التزمنا في المشروع بالموسم الأول بتدريب دفعة من طلاب البكالوريوس في جامعة الملك سعود في عام 2020 حيث كان لدينا قرابة 24 طالبا وكانت حقيقة تجربة مفيدة للغاية أخيرا الهدف الرابع هو دعم الحفاظ ودعم جهود الحفاظ على دادان وتطويره حيث من المفترض أن يكون الموقع أحد الأصول الأثرية الرئيسية في العلا بشكل سريع لمحة عن بعض الخطوات أو من بعض الخطوات التحضيرية ومنهجية عملنا بالنسبة لهذا الموسم الأول كان جزءا مهما من عملنا هو إنشاء قاعدة بيانات متكاملة وسهلة الاستخدام في نفس الوقت حتى يتمكن الجميع من فهم كيفية عملها وخصوصا الطلاب بناء على ذلك قمنا بتطوير قاعدة بيانات على ستراتي بيز توفر قاعدة البيانات هذه إمكانية إدارة الطبقات والمعثورات والمستندات قبل كل شيء لديها ميزة كبيرة حقيقة في إدارة العلاقة بين الطبقات وإنشاء مصفوفات هاريس تلقائية من خلال القيام بذلك فإنه يتحكم فإن قاعدة البيانات تتحكم في تناسق التسجيل وتكتشف تلقائيا أي خطأ في التسجيل كذلك قمنا بترجمة قاعدة البيانات إلى اللغة الإنجليزية وقمنا بتكييفها مع نظام التسجيل الخاص بنا كما استخرجنا أوراق مستمدة من قاعدة البيانات وقمنا بترجمتها إلى اللغة العربية لتسهيل العمل على طلاب الجامعة لاستخدامها في هذا المجال قبل موسم الحفر الأول قمنا باستطلاع أولي للموقع في أبريل من العام 2019 من أجل, تح... من أجل تحديد مناطق الحفر المحتملة وتحديد استراتيجية المسح لاحقا في اكتوبر ومن العام نفسه اجرينا مسحا مغناطيسيا ارضيا في عده اجزاء من الموقع من اجل اختبار كفاءه هذه الطريقه في الموقع. لسوء الحظ كانت هذه التجربه غير ناجحه نظرا لان جدران الموقع كما هو معلوم مغطاه بمجموعه ضخمه من الحجاره المنهاره حيث يبدو انه لا يوجد اي تباين مغناطيسي كافي لاكتشافها. بناء على هذه الخطوات التحضيرية تم تحديد أربع مناطق حفر للموسم الأول المنطقة ألف أو أريا إي عفوا 
وهي ما تسمى الحصن الإسلامي الواقع في شمال الموقع تم حفر هذا المبنى جزئيا من قبل الزملاء في جامعة الملك سعود ولكن لم يتم التأكد بشكل قطعي من وظيفة المبنى وتسلسله الزمني المنطقة باء أو اريا بي وهي الحرم الديني الرئيس في موقع دادان أو ما يسمى معبد ذي غيبة وهو في الطرف الشمالي الغربي تقريبا من الموقع تم حفر هذه المنطقة أيضا من قبل جامعة الملك سعود على مدار 13 عاما ظهر من خلالها العديد من المعطيات لكن هذه الحفريات لم تؤدي حتى الآن إلى فهم واضح وقطعي لتخطيط الحرم أو طبقاته أو تسلسله الزمني المنطقة الثالثة المنطقة جيم أو اريا سي وهي منطقة جديدة تقع في الجزء الأوسط الشرقي تقريبا من الموقع تم اختيار هذه المنطقة من أجل الحصول على لمحة عن قلب المدينة وأيضا لأنها كانت المنطقة التي يبدو أن المباني فيها تم الحفاظ عليها بشكل أفضل المنطقة الرابعة منطقة دال أو اريا دي وهي منطقة تقع على حافة الجبل الشرقي المحادي للموقع واستنادا إلى المجسات الصغيرة التي أجرتها جامعة الملك سعود ومحتوى النقوش المجاورة يبدو أنها تمثل منطقة جنائزية أما فيما يتعلق بمسح الجبل الشرقي فقد تقرر البدء بالركن الجنوبي الغربي منه حيث لوحظ تركيز تركز وتركيز كثيف من المعالم خلال موسم المسح في عام 2019 بالإضافة إلى ذلك أطلقنا مسحا مستهدفا للمحاجر القديمة حيث نحاول أكثر أن نفهم أساليب النحت في هذا الموقع وفي تلك الفترة الزمنية الآن ننتقل بشكل أكثر وبشكل أكثر عمقا إلى نتائج العمل الميداني في المنطقة ألف أو في الأريا أو في أريا أي أو ما تسمى بالحصن الإسلامي ركزت الحفريات على الجزء الشمالي من المبنى الذي لم ينقب مسبقا تم حفر جزء طويل من الجدار الشمالي وكشف عن سلسلة من الوحدات الملاصقة للواجهة الداخلية من الجدار الشمالي وإلى الجنوب كذلك وداخل المبنى تم التنقيب في أحد التلال الصغيرة نسبيا وكشف عن منطقة ذات كثافة عالية في البناء في المجموع تم حفر قرابة 400 متر مربع أكدت الحفريات هذه حقيقة تصميم المبنى الذي يتخذ شكل متوازي الأضلاع مع دعامات نصف دائرية فيما يتعلق بتقنيات البناء لوحظ أن الجدران مبنية من عدة مداميك من الحجر الرملي مع وجود مداميك علوية من طوب اللبن ولكن جميع الجدران لم يكن لها أي أساسات حجرية أعطت دراسات القصر الفخارية تأريخا محتملا للمبنى في حدود القرن التاسع أو العاشر الميلادي لكن تواريخ C14 التي تم الحصول عليها تشهد على إعادة استخدام المبنى كذلك في وقت متأخر في القرن الحادي عشر أو الثاني عشر الميلادي إلى جانب ذلك تقترح أيضا عينات C14 إمكانية وجود مرحلة سابقة أي في العصر الأموي ربما والتي لا يزال من الضروري التأكد منها أخيرا فيما يتعلق بوظيفة المبنى فإن تقنيات البناء وطبيعة الكسر الفخارية تسمح بطرح فرضية جديدة أن هذا المبنى لم يكن حصنا عسكريا حيث أن الجدران ليست, رقي... ليست فقط رقيقة وهشة نسبيا مقارنة بالجدران التي تستخدم عادة في الحصون العسكرية ولكن كذلك الفخار يوحي بوجود ثروة معينة لذلك قد يكون هذا المبنى خاصا بطبقة من النخبة ولكن لا يزال يتحتم علينا التنقيب أكثر لمز... لمزيد من الفهم في المنطقة باء أو اريا بي في معبد أو الحرم الديني لذو غيبة تم بالفعل حفر معظم المنطقة من قبل جامعة الملك سعود ما عدا جزء من الجزء الشمالي الغربي من المنطقة وهو متاح لأعمال التنقيب الجديدة كان الهدف هو حفر هذا الجزء من المنطقة لفهم أكثر حول التسلسل الزمني والتسلسل الطبقي للحرم من السطح وحتى الطبقات السفلية في عام 2020 تم تخصيص معظم الموسم لتوثيق بقايا الحفريات السابقة وفي المجموع تم تنظيف قرابة 99 مترا من المقاطع بالكامل وتوثيقها في صور ثلاثية الأبعاد وتم رسم قرابة 33 مترا من المقاطع كشفت المقاطع كذلك عن بعض الجدران التي لم يتم توثيقها ربما من قبل في الحفريات السابقة من المعروف والواضح أيضا أن هذه المنطقة تعرضت لعمليات نبش متعددة وهذا حقيقة ما يصعب طبيعة فهمها بعد عملية التوثيق تم فتح مجسين إلى الشرق من الحوض الحجري الكبير وهي تظهر أمامكم باللون الأحمر على الصورة والغرض منها تحديد حدود الحرم في الشمال وكذلك توضيح العلاقة بين الحوض والبئر الذي تم الكشف عنه في حفريات جامعة الملك سعود والذي يقع على بعد قرابة عشرة أمتار تقريبا إلى الشرق 
بسوء الحظ لم تتجاوز الحفريات طبقات الرديم السطحية بسبب نهاية الموسم المبكرة ومع ذلك تم العثور على اكتشافات مهمة في طبقات الرديم بما في ذلك العديد من النقوش التي ربما أعيد استخدامها في البناء وظاهرة إعادة الاستخدام في هذا الموقع معروفة ومثبتة مسبقا تتميز منطقة التنقيب الثالثة أو المنطقة جيم أريا سي أيضا بوجود طبقة سطحية ضخمة مكونة من أحجار مختلفة الأحجام كما ترون على الصور وعلى نموذج التضاريس الرقمي دي تي أم فإن المنطقة بها تضاريس غير منتظمة للغاية بسبب وجود العديد من حفر النهب والأحجار المنهارة جزء كبير من تاريخ النهب قد يعود إلى فترة التواجد العثماني المتأخرة بناء على اكتشافات من هذه الفترة كما ذكرت من قبل تم اختيار هذه المنطقة ليس فقط بسبب موقعها المركزي في في وسط الموقع ولكن أيضا لأنها تضم أعلى بقايا معمارية محفوظة في الموقع إلى جانب ذلك تظهر فتحة القناة الواقعة إلى الشرق من هذا الموقع من هذه المنطقة أن لديها تسلسلا عميقا من الرواسب الأثرية والمعمارية والتي تشكل ارتفاعا إلى ما لا يقل عن ثمانية أمتار من السطح الحالي دكتور عبد الرحمن حاول لو رخص لنا في دقيقة لو سمحت دقيقتين يا دكتور بس أبشر في هذا المجال تقرر عمل شبكية أفقية تغطي 2500 متر مربع من أجل كشف الطبقة المعمارية الأخيرة على نطاق واسع ومن ثم تم تقسيم المنطقة إلى مربعات خمسة في خمسة تقريبا وذلك لتحديد موقع الفخار والاكتشافات السطحية بدقة نظرا للنهاية المبكرة للموسم تعذر إكمال الشبكية ولكن مع ذلك تم تنظيف قرابة 1200 متر مربع كشف أو كشف هذا عن عدة أجزاء من الجدران باتجاهات مختلفة بناء على الملتقطات السطحية يبدو أن فترة استخدام المنطقة تمتد من نهاية الألف الثاني قبل الميلاد إلى حدود الفترة النبطية. سأتجاوز بشكل سريع هذه بعض المكتشفات التي تم الكشف عنها في المنطقة سي وهي أيضا معاد استخدامها كما هو في المنطقة بي. أريا دي أو المنطقة الأخيرة من التنقيب وهي تقع في منطقة منطقة قريبة من حافة الجبل وتم اختيار هذه المنطقة لوجود العديد من النقوش الددانية التي تشير إلى المقابر والتماثيل. مما يشير الى وجود ربما ضريح جنائزي. الى جانب ذلك ادت عمليات الكشف الصغيره جدا التي اجرتها جامعه الملك سعود في العام 2017 الى القاء الضوء على مجموعه من المكتشفات ذات العلاقه بالطقوس الجنائزيه وكوات محفوره في الصخر ربما لوضع التماثيل او غيرها. من اجل هذا تم فتح مجس طويل عند قاعده الجبل وبعد هذا بعد بعد تنقيب وتوسيع المجس يمكن اعاده بناء التسلسل كالتالي، اولا تم استخدام المنطقه كمحجر ثم تم بناء الضريح ومن ثم في المرحلة الثالثة تم تدمير الضريح وتحولت المنطقة مرة أخرى إلى مقلع ويبدو أن تدمير الضريح كان حدث قبل العام 90 قبل الميلاد تشمل القطع الأثرية التي تم الكشف عنها في طبقة الرديم كمية كبيرة من أجزاء التماثيل ذات الأحجام المختلفة والتي تشبه إلى حد بعيد تلك التي تم العثور عليها في موقع درج على الجانب الآخر من الوادي ومن المحتمل أنها كانت تقدم كقرابين بالإضافة إلى التماثيل هناك أيضا بعض المكتشفات التي لها علاقة بطقوس العبادة مثل قواعد التماثيل وموائد القرابين والمباخر تشير قاعدة التمثال التي تحتوي نقشا ويمكن رؤيتها في أمامكم في الشاشة إلى إهداء تمثال الإله سلمان الذي يدعون الإله الرئيسي الذي تم تكريمه في الضريح ستتداوز نتائج المسح وأحاول الختم بشكل سريع أنه هذا باختصار أهم النتائج للموسم الأول القصير الذي كما ترون الحظي بنتائج واعدة وبدأنا الحمد لله منذ قرابة أربع أسابيع الموسم الثاني والنتائج كذلك مواعدة ومبشرة ختاماً أود أن أشكر جميع من دعم هذا المشروع كيّر النور وأخص بالذكر سمو محافظ الهيئة الملكية لمحافظة العلا وسعادة الرئيس التنفيذي الذين يتابعون سير العمل بشكل متواصل أيضاً الشكر للزملاء في الهيئة الملكية الذين لا يتوانون في تسهيل الصعوبات كذلك أقدم الشكر لجميع الزملاء في كلية السياحة والآثار في جامعة الملك سعود وعلى رأس سعادة العميد وسعادة رئيس القسم الذين لم يدخلوا جهدا في الموسم الأول في تسهيل مهمة الفريق السعودي الفرنسي وشكرا شكرا دكتور عبد الرحمن على هذا العرض المميز لنتائج الحفريات في منطقة العلا ننتقل إلى الأسئلة We now go back to the questions. The first uh, question to uh, Dr. Solin. Yes, I'm listening. Based on uh, the location of uh, Farasan Island, we believe that there is a mixture of different culture that affected uh, the, uh, the island and uh, Surround. The question is, what uh, what culture were affected by island concern, and was uh, 
the influence right from within the Arabian Peninsula or from the Africa country? Uh, thank you for the question. It depends. Like so far, the pottery study is not is not uh, far along, but from what we can see, the for the regional components of the of the pottery wares we collected during surveys and excavation, it is mostly from south, southern Arabia. So that for the Roman period as well as for the ancient uh, uh, late Bronze Age in South Arabia, it's coming from the Tihama coast and the southwestern coast of the um, Arabian Peninsula. In the later phases, it's um, we have also some some wares from the from the Tihama from Zabid to the 9th, 11th century, as well as um, Ethiopia, not Ethiopian, but Aksumite and Adulitan ware that we find in some sites, but not in great quantities so far. Okay, thank you so much. The second question, uh, Dr. Guillaume. Yes, you are. Yeah. The question there is a uh, reason. Uh, uh, can you speak yeah. a bit louder, please? Okay, one minute, please. Thank you. There is uh, a uh, response between a uh, thumb and the site of al Bida and uh, uh, what is found in the Nabatean kingdom in uh, Al-Ula and uh, Batra. The, the question is, are these works at the al Bida were uh, directly affected by uh, the inhabitants uh, of uh, the uh, al Bida from the Nabatean and what uh, uh, is the history? Yes, so it's a, a very uh, large uh, question uh, concerning the, the history of El Bada and what happened to, uh, to El Bada, if I well understood, um, in comparison with Petra and, and, and Igra. That's that's the question? I can't hear you yes. well, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, yeah well, <laughs> I would say this is difficult to say. I mean, as you have seen, the relationship between Petra, uh, Al Bada, Petra, and, and Igra is obvious uh, through the, in particular, to the rock cut tombs. But uh, I must, we must admit that, uh, I mean, rock tombs are clearly from the Nabatean periods through decorations and, and other things. If you compare Petra, Elbada to Petra and, and, uh, and Egra, we have only 33 monumental tombs in, in, in Elbada. And these are not related at all to the Median period. They are related to the Nabatean periods at the same time with the tombs in Egra and in Petra. So uh, if you if you want, uh, we can just make a relationship chronological uh, relationship for the moment. But you, as you have seen, the quality of the tombs in 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 El Bada as much is much more deteriorated than, than those in in Egra and in in Petra. Uh, but one again, once again, it's not at all related to um, to the median period and uh, to the end of the site. So it's um, uh, yeah, it's really the history of. We're just trying to, for the moment, to understand the, the side the Nabatean settlement, but there was uh, certainly a later occupation during the Roman and Byzantine period. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Guillaume. The third question, uh, Doctor, for uh, Dr. Leila, is there any relation between Nabateans in uh, Hajra and uh, Al Bida? Uh. <laughs> It's very difficult to say if there's a difference uh, between categories of population. The only way one could do that is by uh, going through the names they bear. And for the moment, there are very few Nabatean inscriptions found in Al Bada. What I know about them, especially a few inscriptions which have been found inside the tombs, it has, is that there is no difference between actually. Um, there is no difference between the names borne by Nabateans in El Bada, Nabatean, the names of the people of the Nabateans born in Petra and those from Hegra. But we need more information to uh, specify that better, as well as to the pottery and coins. But basically, I think it's the same, the same Nabateans. Thank you so much, Dr. Leila. 
اخر سؤال للدكتور رحمن سؤال يقول ما علاقة مملكة لحيان بدادان وهل كان للحيانين توسع باتجاه الفاو دكتور عبد الرحمن تسمعني أنت الصوت يا دكتور عبد الرحمن معذرة معذرة كنت على الميوت آه هذا حقيقة واحد من أهم الأسئلة المطروحة الآن آه على الساحة مطروح حقيقة يعني من أهم الجدليات والإشكاليات العلمية هو العلاقة بين مملكتي دادان ومملكتي لحيان نعرف أنه في فئة من المتخصصين يعتقدون أنهما مملكة واحدة تسمى باسم مملكة دادان والشعب كان يسمى باسم لحيان وهناك من يعتقد أنهما مملكتين مستقلتين إشارة إلى وجود نقوش تذكر اسم ملك دادان ونقوش تذكر اسم ملك لحيان لكن حاليا ما نعتقد انه فعلا مملكتين مستقلتين انتهت مملكه دادان ربما بوصول الملك البابلي نبونيد الى تيمه وقتل وذكره على في احد النقوش ربما انه قتل احد ملوك دادان ومن ثم كان هناك ما يسمى بقبيله لحيان التي كانت ربما توجد الى الجنوب من دادان واخذت السيطره وزمام السيطره على على هذه المملكه. المملكه لحيان مؤكد انها توسعت ربما وهذه مقولات تحتاج الى مزيد من الاثبات انها وصلت حتى حدود الاردن من مؤكد انها وصلت الى تيمه. فيما يخص الفاو لا اعتقد حاليا لدينا اي ادله واضحه، الدليل الوحيد لدينا هو وجود نقش في الفاو يذكر ان شخصا قدم قربانا الى الاله ذو غيبه، ونحن نعرف ان الاله ذو غيبه هو الاله الرئيسي للحيانيين، من هنا جاء الاعتقاد ان اللحيانيين وصلوا الى قرية الفاو ولكن هذا يعني حقيقة صعب تماما القبول به في الفترة الحالية. شكرا دكتور عبد الرحمن. Uh, we arrive uh, to final the, this session. Uh, I would like to uh, thank you the Heritage Commission for this forum and all speakers for the useful information we got. Uh, like to you uh, دكتور عبد الله. شكرا دكتور خالد، شكرا للجميع. ويعطيكم العافية على هذا اليوم وإن شاء الله تعالى نلتقي غدا في بقية الأوراق العلمية ستبدأ إن شاء الله تعالى الساعة الثانية عشر ظهرا بتوقيت الرياض